Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus in Jamaica. We are the FST. I am your moderator, Marvadine Singh Wilmot, research scientist and lecturer in the Department of Chemistry, and this is Forum 3, the final edition of our special Science for Today series, Fighting COVID-19, Science in Action. The FSD has played a key role in the UE's rankings from Times Higher Education, which places the UE in the top 1% of universities in Latin America and the Caribbean, in the top 1% of Golden Age universities, and as the number one university in the Caribbean. The FST has been credited for leadership on problems such as Sustainable Development Goal number 13, Climate Action, and Sustainable Development Goal number 3, Good Health and Well-Being. And we are recognized as the go-to place for science knowledge, research, and solutions in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic is a matter of great urgency and we must strengthen our resilience with scientific solutions. Many of you have told us that forums one and two in this series, Fighting COVID-19, Science in Action, has been useful in your daily lives and in your daily fight and in your building of your personal resilience against COVID-19. You have expressed how much knowledge, understanding, and practical solutions we have brought to you. And so we know that through the FSD, science is serving its mission. Today, as we close the series, we focus on the way forward. We deepen the conversation around international scientific collaboration and we examine some specific opportunities in the Commonwealth as we move the fight forward. We talk about the economic fallout of COVID-19 and the role of science and technology in redefining healthcare and education. Responding to your requests, we talk more about Jamaican natural products and their value in addressing regional health challenges. Our very popular section on COVID conspiracies take on 5G and COVID. And of course, we hear more from our students in their response to COVID-19. So stay with us, everybody, and make your contribution by asking questions or making comments in the live chat, which is being moderated by my colleague, Dr. Kimberly Stevenson. Now to our first speaker, Dr. Vicki Gardner. Dr. Gardner is the current general manager of the Tasmanian Division of Engineers in Australia. She holds a PhD in synthetic chemistry from Monash University and a graduate certificate in project management from the University of New England. Dr. Gardner has led an illustrious career in academia holding postdoctoral positions at the University of Southampton, University of New South Wales, the Australian Research Council, and lecturing at the University of Tasmania. Later on, she excelled in industry, working in R&D, process and service development, supply chain management, and various business development areas in companies like Oz Industry and Marinova. She's currently the president of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, but today, ladies and gentlemen, I claim the honor as the first to introduce her to the Caribbean as the first president of the newly incorporated Commonwealth Chemistry. Commonwealth Chemistry is a federation of Commonwealth chemical societies that aims to strengthen scientific capacity inspire and elevate the role of the chemical sciences to society and policymakers, and celebrate the achievements in chemistry. Now, as a chemist, you know that would be dear to me, and I have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Gardner and other chemists from the Commonwealth on the formation of Commonwealth chemistry. So now I take great pleasure 
in presenting and welcoming Dr. Vicki Gardner to speak on the topic International Scientific Collaboration, an Immediate Imperative. Thanks for having me and, and, and for the wonderful invitation to present to you today. Um, I, I send a warm welcome from um, Australia's capital, Canberra, where I am located, and also um, on behalf of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, for which I am the president. Today, um, I'm not going to talk about the chemistry of the coronavirus because even though I am a chemist, I haven't actually been working in chemistry labs for quite some time and I'm certainly more of an inorganic chemist rather than a protein and um, virologist. So what I really want to talk about today is the importance uh, of collaboration as part of the challenges of um, that we're facing in terms of the, the coronavirus and the like. For me, it's really important because chemistry is an underpinning and enabling science that really is at the heart of what all of the discoveries that we're going through. And without the collaboration, it's you, you're not going to be able to get that chemistry coming through. So what I do want to acknowledge, though, is the impact of the, the coronavirus that we're having seeing all around the world. Um, you know, as of yesterday, I looked up um, the, the John Hopkins um, website and you know over 20 million cases of COVID is 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 very um, is very sad and, and you know certainly the seven over 700,000 deaths you know these these get such big numbers but importantly they are real people so um, me personally I've, I've known uh, a friend of mine has, has lost his father and and three. Um, three family members to, to coronavirus. So it just reminds you that it's more than just the numbers, it's the people. So certainly my deepest sympathies go to those who have, have lost loved ones. Now, the, the question is, when all of this comes down to it, is are we against the odds in terms of trying to find a vaccine for, for the coronavirus and the like? The, as we, you know, you've probably already heard that, you know, that it's about 10 to 15 years normally for the development of a of a vaccine through to actually um, making it available to to um, to the population. As when I was doing some research on all of this, you know, the quickest um, the quickest development of a vaccine was four years for the mumps in 19 the 1960s. Um, so that you know, that's that's almost 60 years ago, obviously, or it is 60 years ago. And it was around about the same time that Dorothy Hodgkin was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for the X-ray structure of vitamin B. So when you think about the technology advancements in 60 years, you know, it's, it's really um, quite phenomenal and where chemistry has played a part in that. So I guess importantly, we don't, we've not had a vaccine for coronavirus up till now. Um, but when you look at the timeline uh, that I've got on this slide, you know, the, I guess the, the most important thing is that the collaboration has been so great between researchers, industry, government and regulatory um, authorities that, you know, if, if it's going to work in the time that we're looking at, it's going to work now. So obviously from the 9th of January, that was when we were first, um, announced, first made aware of the coronavirus-related um, issue in, in Wuhan. And even since then, you know, we start that by the January 12th, we've already got the genetic sequence from, from China. And, you know, when you look at back in the 90s when the human genome was first being um, um, mapped, you know, the, the amount of time it took for that to occur compared to now, you know, it's, it's just absolutely amazing the way that technology has happened. By March, um, we had the first phase one clinical trial started for, for a vaccine. Um, March 30, we've got the crystal structure um, published. And, you know, when you come, again, vitamin B in the 1960s where it's Nobel laureate, looking at a, a, a crystal structure or x-ray structure for a vaccine now, it's almost like, um, you know, standard types of, um, or for a virus, it's just standard practice now. So the technology and chemistry underpinning all that is amazing. So going through all of those things, you know, even though we were only um, about eight months into, seven to eight months into um, a new way of living. Um, you know, the, the WHO site, the World Health Organization, states that there's 22 preventative and over, 
um, 1,300 treatment clinical trials registered. So the, the fact that that's all been done through collaboration and, and, this, and the picture on the, on the right here shows where all those trials are in terms of numbers. And when you click on, those web, on that website, you can see where all the collaboration is going on. Well, I think the interesting thing here that I see is that um, the, cl the, the clinical trials are very much in certain areas and there are other areas where there's not a lot of activity, not, not necessarily activity, but, you know, the opportunity for collaboration is, is, is much is higher. Um, and while I, while I take nothing away from, from the research that's been going on, I have a feeling that it's probably a lot of the research that's been, that is being undertaken is probably very much driven by white men. So, you know, certainly one of the things that's um, really important to consider perhaps is, you know, what, what other opportunities could there be um, to encourage um, um, research and collaboration from other um, people and groups of people from around the world? And when you think about the um, commitment that all of this collaboration has been um, that has, has developed from this collaboration. If we can start to get people more involved and in greater opportunities for collaboration across all of our um, UN Sustainable Development Goals, just imagine how much of an impact that could be. So while we have obviously a big focus on the good health and wellbeing um, development goal at the moment, obviously through the coronavirus, you know, there's other imperatives around the climate change, responsible consumption and production, sustainable cities and communities, and certainly from um, the Pacific area where, I, where I'm obviously located, you know, that, that climate change impact on countries where they're um, looking at um, going underwater, essentially, um, is, is really important. So there's, there's lots of opportunities for collaboration um, and, and, and um, activity across the world. So... As part of this, it was an initiative that was started by the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, and that was really looking at bringing the Commonwealth um, chemistry community together. So I guess the, the question is, so what? why should we? Um, well, chemistry is taught in schools and universities all across the Commonwealth, but the resources and educational res uh, characteristics and infrastructure of the Commonwealth nations cover a wide range. So, you know, there's there's um, lots of opportunities to be able to collaborate, um, but we need to make sure that everyone is on a somewhat similar footing. So building on the shared values of the Commonwealth, there is an opportunity to create a system of helping all Commonwealth nations to work together to increase the impact and quality of chemistry output overall. So by bringing together the developed and developing regions of the Commonwealth, there is a real good opportunity to contribute to enabling or enriching our discipline of chemistry, to building innovation and ultimately contributing to the achieving those um, sustain, sustainable development goals. So building Commonwealth chemistry as an inclusive federation, this is the first science-based organisation of its type. Um, it's not only beneficial to society, um, and the discipline, but also um, timely in supporting national chemical societies, especially given the post -pan in the post-pandemic era, um, may accelerate further challenges um, experienced by many of the chemical societies. So um, that's the reason why um, Commonwealth Chemistry was, was established. So if you look at the um, essentially what it is that Commonwealth Chemistry is, uh, the members of Commonwealth Chemistry are com uh, chemical societies. So it's it's through um, association, through your own chemical society, that you have access to um, the um, initiatives that Commonwealth Chemistry is doing. Um, the vision of the organisation is one voice, uh, one community, one voice, catalyzing equality for all. So it comes back to that idea of encouraging um, a really strong voice. Um, from all of the Commonwealth countries um, in, in chemistry and making sure that it's an, a, an equal opportunity for everyone to participate in, in that community. Um, you know, we want to inspire, create, uh, celebrate and elevate the role and practice of chemical sciences for the benefit of the Commonwealth nations and their people. 
So that's very much around what is it is that we can learn from each other, how can we help each other, and to make sure that everyone is involved in, in chemistry around the world. And, of course, to uphold the core values of, of, common, of the Commonwealth. So as I mentioned, the reason, the, the guiding principles behind the Commonwealth chemistry is very much around equal and inclusive representative of all the Commonwealth nations um, and recognising that, um, you know, some, some countries are going to be able to be contributing more in terms of resources or ideas. Um, but the big thing is, is that essentially what we're trying to do is, um, you know, bring the tide in so that all of the boats can rise as part of that. Um, initiative. So these were the um, conversations that we've had since the meeting in, in June, um, July 2018. Um, as we said, the, the idea is, is that by achieving all of these, um, these goals in the mission is that we will have a positive impact on individual chemists across the Commonwealth nations. So we'll be actually to be able to improve um, their opportunity to collaborate, to build their profile, to get their research out there and to be able to increase the opportunity to undertake more research that's very impactful as, as it is. You know, this will then obviously go on to benefiting the, the society at large. So as I said before, chemistry is such an enabling science that um, not only is driving a lot of the initial um, research into the uh, coronavirus, but if you look at all the rest of the um, sustainable development goals, Chemistry is going to be there, um, you know, pushing front, pushing the frontiers of all of those and to to achieve those goals. We're also really encouraging the um, the growth in, of um, existing societies. So, you know, helping our, our members, our member societies, to be able to um, increase the value that they can offer their own members. So that that's really a, a big important. Um, aspect of what it is that we are doing as, as a federation, but also to um, make sure that we are diversifying our, our discipline in terms of the people, the active participants um, in our discipline, because as we all know, diversity actually improves decision making um, and in, in brings a new way of thinking, increases the pool of knowledge and the way of thinking in, in everything that we do. So what, it is, what is it that Commonwealth Chemistry is going to do as part of all this? So here, here's a list of all of the, um, act, uh, the, the activities that the, the board and the um, roundtable had come up with uh, back in, in June 2018. So, you know, we want to look at how we can understand, we want to make sure that we understand the challenges, needs and opportunities um, and support the development of research infrastructure. So I guess a lot of the things that we're going to be doing around this is, is around surveys and producing research reports um, that, that, that our society members can use to demonstrate, okay, well, this is where we sit um, in the Commonwealth and you, hopefully to be able to influence policy um, at their local levels, but also through what Commonwealth Chemistry can do is, is through the Commonwealth Secretariat it is to, to promote, um, you know, the, the needs of, of different countries around the world. We're also wanting to make sure that we can connect chemists. So this is a um, this is not just to um, increase the collaboration of research, but also to raise the profile of, of chemists. So we're very much concentrating on um, the early career chemists um, to make sure that the next that the pipeline of chemists coming through um, this, the the discipline are well connected and that they are able to 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 um, increase their, their networks um, as they're going through that development for the early stage of their career. Of course, we're, we're wanting to make sure that we can bring um, chemistry to um, policy um, makers, the decision makers, so that we can also show that it's of value to society. So that's very much um, part of the, the um, the objective of the Federation is to bring researchers, industry and um, Commonwealth policy developers, government together so that we can actually start to think about, okay, well, what is it that needs to be done? What is it that we need to do from a policy perspective to make sure that chemistry actually has a, has a say and influences the decision making there? Of course, teaching is really important as well. Um, and, and, you know, a few weeks ago I actually presented to um, 
the Indian teaching society around the Commonwealth chemistry as well. So the idea of that, making sure that we can um, learn from each other in terms of best practice for, for teaching and, and sharing resources where we can to be able to uh, make sure that we have great education for, for, for students all around the world within the, in, within the Commonwealth. So, you know, certainly the, the idea around the um, promoting diversity and equal opportunities, as I said earlier, the organisation is very inclusive and we want to make sure that every um, country in the Commonwealth does have an opportunity to particip uh, participate in, our, um, in all of the activities that we do and I'll talk about some of those um, things in, in a minute. So ultimately, that's the kind of thing that we're, we're looking at doing. Um, obviously, there's a, a plan that we have. We can't do it all at once, um, but certainly these are the kinds of things that we'll be looking to do um, going forward. So who is Commonwealth Chemistry? As I mentioned, the members themselves are the member societies. So, for example, the Royal Australian Chemical Institute is a, is a member um, and obviously the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, Trinidad, Tobago um, and, and the Caribbean is certainly um, represented, as you can see here, in the in the board members, uh, the executive board members, with Michael Ford being the representative uh, for your region on, on the board at the moment. So you can see here we, we've very much concentrated on making sure we've got a very diverse um, board that has representatives from, from regions all around the world within the Commonwealth. And we're also very much considering um, the gender split as well. So you can see that we've got quite a good female representation on that on that board. So this is very much living the um, the talk that the organisation has been set up to do. So what I want to do now is just go through some of the initiatives um, that have been started. So as you all will be very well aware, is that the first face-to-face um, -face Congress for for Commonwealth Chemistry is going to be in Trinidad Tobago and I was extremely disappointed that I wasn't able to to come over earlier this year um, with having had all the flights booked and everything like that. But I guess the, the kind of thing that we're doing here in terms of encouraging inclusivity um, um, and diversity is making sure that we, we had um, equal representation from those to participate from all Commonwealth countries that were um, wanting to, to attend. And also making sure that we actually had, we, we did set a goal, a target of 30, at least 30% um, female participation as well. Um, so between that and looking at, um, you know, making sure that our program was um, catering for the early career chemists to be able to um, increase their networks um, and build the profile of, um, of their research. What we've actually managed to do is, is to provide quite a, a diverse um, conference program through the scientific organising committee and the local organising committee um, that really does represent the different interests of, of the Commonwealth across across the globe and the, the different priorities. So that, um, that Congress is unfortunately postponed uh, the face-to-face. -face. Obviously, it's not necessarily a good time to be having it now. Um, but in the middle of all that, we've got a society, uh, our scientific organising committee, which is looking at how can we actually still continue to build the um, or to to deliver the the objectives of what this congress was going to do throughout the um, period between now and when we have our face to face congress in Trinidad Tobago. So one of those initiatives is to have a, a poster event um, where all of the early career chemists that were going to be attending the Congress actually do have an opportunity to promote their research um, through a poster event. And that's going to actually be held in about two weeks' time. So um, we've got people, um, all, all of the 150 early career um, researchers um, preparing their posters um, for, where people can ha come and have a look. So certainly um, keep in touch with, with what that is going to be, um, when that's going to be happening, and it would be great to be able to um, see if you can um, see what, what's going on around the world. One of the other initiatives, given that um, we did have to start um, refocusing our activities from the face-to-face the, the face -face, um, Congress, but also still keeping in mind how can the 
how can Commonwealth Chemistry assist its member societies in keeping connections with their members, their individual members, and to be able to um, help with um, ongoing member value? Um, it was very nice of the Royal Society of Chemistry to offer access to um, Chemistry Worlds to, to all of our members, member societies' members. So I really encourage you to be able to access, uh, to, to access this. Um, the, the website is there, so please um, feel free to, to go and um, access that, getting stories from um, all around the world and just keeping contact with, with other um, activities that are going on in that respect. So coming back to the, the survey piece I mentioned before, we have got one survey that is going to be um, launched very shortly. And this, again, is very much looking at the early career chemists in terms of what are the challenges that they're facing. Um, and this is looking at training and funding, working environment, um, career progression networks and collaborations. So, you know, what is it that we can do as a, um, as a, a group of um, member associations and member societies to be able to progress our um, early career chemists and how can we collaborate together to, to make sure that they're, they're um, very much um, at the opportunity to maximise the opportunities to collaborate and, and promote their research. So that's about to be kicked off in September and, and we expect that the results from that will be released um, sometime next year in a report that we can then start to put some activities around that to assist our early career chemists. So very would love to make sure that um, you know the, the people that are um, we, we're going out to to certainly the one, the early career chemists that were going to be participating in the congress, but um, you know I'd be great for making sure that um, you can help um, encourage people to participate in the survey. So that's the kind of things that we're up to. I guess the main thing that I want to say is, um, just to finish off is that. Um, you know, as a scientific community, we do have a challenge to progress collaboration under the circumstances that we see ourselves. Um, it's very much the, um, the the fact that we are in a situation where we can't get together um, physically, but we can still virtually. So, as I said, this um, scientific organising committee, which is a, a it's, it's a board board group, and um, is very much looking at what it is that we can actually be providing between now and the and the face-to-face -face, um, Congress. So I'd really encourage you to think about what is it that um, would help you and your society um, to be able to, to um, build member value um, and derive those, those opportunities for building profile and making connections and, um, and also promoting the research that's been going on. So please work um, with Marva Dean and Michael on that, on how the Commonwealth Chemistry can assist you. Um, and with that, I will finish. And, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. Commonwealth Chemistry is a refreshing and relevant partnership. I mean, the Commonwealth partners on sports with Commonwealth Games, on policy through the Commonwealth Secretariat on culture, education, law, and charity. Partnership in science is indeed an immediate imperative, particularly in the current fight against COVID-19. Once again, Dr. Gardiner, we thank you. Our second contributor, Dr. David Picking, is a postdoctoral research fellow at the FSD's Natural Products Institute. His research aims to provide strong evidence base for safe medicinal plant use within the Jamaican healthcare system and to support the development of a successful Jamaican natural health products industry. To this end, Dr. David Picking has been involved in the development of the Tremil Network, Traditional Medicines in the Islands, which validates and expands medicinal plant use in primary healthcare across the Caribbean. His work has led to the documentation and distribution of a community book detailing both the traditional knowledge and scientific data for 25 commonly used medicinal plants. And he's also documenting the use of root tonics across the island, which is an under-researched area, but is key. In fact, it's a key aspect of Jamaican national heritage. 
I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Picking on Jamaican natural products, their value in addressing regional health challenges. So my name is Dr. David Picking from the Natural Products Institute. Uh, so I'd like to start by thanking the moderator, uh, Dr. Singh Wilmot. So I'm talking about the Jamaican natural products and their value in addressing regional health challenges. So the areas I want to cover are natural products for national development, natural products for health security, Jamaican surveys and clinical trials and a particular type of clinical trial using reverse pharmacology and then conclusions. So by introducing my talk, I think it's important to understand that within the context of COVID-19, we're all obviously looking for silver bullets, but the reality is for the development of pharmaceutical drugs in the region and for the development of natural products, we're currently unlikely to find any silver bullets. But hopefully in the talk I'm about to give, um, I can focus on some of the low-hanging fruits and the opportunities that exist within our natural products. So moving straight into natural products for uh, national development. So what do we know about Jamaica? We know that Jamaica is a biodiversity hotspot with high levels of bioactivity. What does that actually mean? Well, it means that in Jamaica we have a lot of particularly uh, plants that have medicinal properties that people historically have used to maintain health and to treat a wide range of health conditions. And by high levels of bioactivity, what we know is that, again, through that traditional use and through extensive and increasing research, that a lot of those plants contain what we call the key phytochemicals or key constituents that give those plants their medicinal properties. And so when a plant is said to be bioactive, those phytochemicals are known to have a positive, health, a positive impact on, on our health. We also, know, we also know that in Jamaica, we have a wealth of traditional knowledge. And based on surveys, we've identified that 73% of Jamaicans use botanical medicines on a regular basis. In 2018, the Jamaican government gave approval for natural health products, NHPs, also referred to nutraceuticals, to be recognized for the first time as a separate category in the country's Food and Drug Act, with changes expected to be enacted in 2020. This is a significant opportunity for us, based on the change in legislation, to move ahead with the Jamaican nutraceutical industry. And the change in legislation with uh, introduction, so it'll become the, the, the Food, Natural Health Product, and Drug Act, mirrors uh, very similarly the, uh, the system that is currently in place in Canada for their nutraceutical industry, which has proved very, very successful uh, for the Canadian nutraceutical industry. So I talked about nutraceuticals. So the first place to start is, well, what is the definition of a nutraceutical? We know a nutraceutical based on, on some of the definitions is a product that contains one or more of the dietary ingredients, like a vitamin, a mineral, an herb, or other botanical, an amino acid, or any other substance used to supplement the diet by increasing total dietary intake. So now looking at natural products for national development and looking at what the differences are between uh, nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals. In terms of the economic value, we know that the nutraceutical industry globally was worth 379 billion US dollars in 2017. We also know that between the years 2000 and 2014, 18% of FDA approved pharmaceutical drugs were derived directly from natural products. If we look at those figures, comparing the size of the market for nutraceuticals and the size of the market that's estimated by the end of 2020, uh, we can see that at 379 billion, that's a very sizable market. The market for pharmaceuticals is estimated to reach 1,420 billion US dollars in 2020. 
Again, looking at the differences between nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals. Uh, nutraceuticals are functional foods, vitamins, minerals, botanicals, uh, amino acids, and probiotics. Whilst in the main, pharmaceuticals are actually uh, individual uh, synthetic substances or chemical compounds. We also know that nutraceuticals, and I talk specifically here about botanicals within nutraceuticals, botanicals are, are made up of very complex combinations of what we call phytochemicals. And these phytochemicals are normally classified according to their chemical structure into different groups. So you'll hear terms like tannins, flavonoids, saponins, alkaloids. And it's those phytochemical groups that give rise to the medicinal property in a plant. What we also know is, unlike a pharmaceutical, that complex uh, combination of phytochemicals often gives rise to what is called a synergistic or entourage effect. And these effects mean that the individual phytochemical, if taken alone, wouldn't necessarily show a medicinal value. But in combination, the combination of those different phytochemicals often gives a plant-based medicine its medicinal value. And that's one of the fundamental differences between a nutraceutical and a pharmaceutical drug. We know that nutraceuticals, but I'll mention a caveat here, not all nutraceuticals can be said to be completely safe. But generally, nutraceuticals come with a relatively low risk of side effects and low levels of adverse drug reactions. In the case of pharmaceuticals, we know that they come with low, medium, and high risks of side effects um, and high levels of documented adverse drug reactions associated with the pharmaceutical drug. In terms of their regulation, this is where there's a, a major difference between nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals. Unfortunately, nutraceuticals currently experience wide variations in regulations, both, both by country and regionally. And that impacts uh, significantly on the quality um, standards that exist. So the caveat, buyer beware, very much exists for nutraceuticals. So one has to be very careful about the source um, of the product that consumers are buying. In terms of pharmaceuticals, however, the industry is very heavily regulated internationally and rigorous quality and standards are, are maintained internationally. In terms of availability, nutraceuticals are widely available always as uh, over-the-counter products in uh, supermarkets, speciality shops such as health stores in Jamaica and via the internet. Pharmaceuticals generally are only available either on prescription or over-the-counter in pharmacies. So now I'd like to move on to talk about nutraceuticals and uh, the value chain. And in terms of speaking about the value chain, I want to look at how um, science and research can move a natural product up the value chain, both in terms of the economic value of that natural product, but also, and probably more importantly, in terms of its value for health security. So if we take as an example um, turmeric, turmeric is a well-known food that's incorporated um, extensively in curry. Um, it's eaten uh, worldwide, but it's also extremely well documented. Lots of published um, papers on the value of turmeric in the human diet and for the treatment of various health conditions. So I want to look at taking turmeric up that value chain. So the slides I'm showing show uh, turmeric as a food grade powder, simply ground and packaged, would be worth in a, as a price per daily dose, so we're talking about its medicinal use here, would be valued at say three Jamaican dollars. If you take that same food grade powder and simply put it into a capsule and, and change the way in which uh, you are presenting it to a consumer, the value moves up to 30 Jamaican dollars. Then if you really start to put some science and research into it, one of the challenges, for example, with turmeric is turmeric is not, or the key phytochemicals in turmeric are not so bioavailable. What do I mean by bioavailable? Okay, so curcumin, which is the phytochemical in turmeric that gives it its color and its medicinal value, 
generally is not that easily absorbed. In other words, it doesn't move from the digestive tract into the bloodstream. But through science and through um, some of the extraction processes, you can actually significantly increase that bioavailability and therefore increase the efficacy of this plant extract um, in the maintenance of health. And economically, you see the value jumping there from 30 Jamaicas, Jamaican dollars up to $120. If you then look at the growing conditions of that plant and actually optimize the growing conditions in terms of guaranteeing organic standards, so you're optimizing the soil conditions and the environment in which that plant is grown and you're guaranteeing that it's free from pesticides and herbicides, you again see a significant value, both in terms of its medicinal properties because now the plant is naturally optimized to produce high levels of those key phytochemicals, but also in terms of its economic value, it now comes in at 190 Jamaican dollars per dose. So now I want to switch to looking at the use of natural products and their value in health security. And I'm going to focus mainly on botanicals. That's what's predominantly used in Jamaica. So if we look at the value of botanicals in Jamaica for health security, I want to look at them in terms of three key areas. One is very much one of those hanging fruits. The second one is a moderate hanging fruit, and the other one is a much longer-term investment. But at a community level, uh, you can look at the development of natural products at a community level. As we've said, people are already, 73% of people are using medicinal plants day in, day out. We can look at enhancing that use of medicinal plants um, for primary health care and integrating it into a national health care system, and that would be at a community level. Then we can look at the development of nutraceuticals, and then the third level would be development of pharmaceuticals. So taking each one in turn, looking at the community use, um, in the region, an organization called TRAML, which is a Spanish acronym for Traditional Medicines in the Islands Network, is a collaboration of um, scientists, healthcare professionals, from pharmacologists, ethnopharmacologists, ethno, um, ethnobotanists, interested in looking at the use of traditional medicines in primary health care. And over the last 20 years, 50 surveys have com been completed across the Caribbean region. We completed a Trammell survey in Jamaica in 2011. So the key focus for the Trammell network is to look at the use of medicinal plants in community health with a focus on safety, efficacy, and quality. These are the three, three of the main uh, key aspects of the WHO strategy for developing and enhancing the use of traditional medicine in primary health care across the globe. One thing to also mention is uh, Trammell and Cuba. The Cuban government worked with the Trammell collaboration to identify a number of key medicinal plants that were being used in Cuba to document their traditional use and to rigorously document how those plants could be grown, how they could be prepared, and then how they could be dispensed within the national healthcare system that exists in Cuba. Um, so that's been going for a number of years and it's an integral part of the Cuban healthcare system. Also to mention that Trammell has all of this information available online. They maintain what's called a pharmacopoeia, and I'm going to talk more about what a pharmacopoeia is. But that information is freely available at www.trammell.net. So then looking at the other aspect, which was the potential development of nutraceuticals. So again, we talked about how... Um, the new legislation that should kick in this year based on the Canadian model, loosely based on the Canadian model for natural health products, how that will impact how we can develop nutraceutical products and what health claims can be made within that regulatory framework. So at the most basic level, what the regulatory framework requires is that your nutraceutical is safe and is safe both in terms of the quality of the product and safe in terms of its safe use in humans. And to prove safe use in humans, you have to have documented traditional use going back. Well, depending on the region in Europe, they require 15 years of documented traditional use. So with 
those quality standards that, for example, look at good agricultural practice, look at current good manufacturing practice, and hopefully would incorporate organic growing standards as well. You maintain that you have a nutraceutical that is of high quality. The next level would be to be able to make certain claims about health benefits for your nutraceutical. And this would be requiring you to actually be able to say in your uh, botanical medicine, for example, that you have certain types of um, phytochemicals. So, for example, um, flavonoids are known to be very beneficial for cardiovascular health. So if you can show that in your botanical nutraceutical you have high levels of particular botanicals called flavonoids, then you could make a health benefit claim because you can actually show that there are a definitive uh, number of those phytochemicals in your plant and, and, the, uh, and the amount that is there. So that would allow you to what's called characterize and standardize your nutraceutical and to quantify the levels of those key phytochemicals in your plant. And with that, you'd then be able to make those health benefit claims. So for example, this product will help support cardiovascular health. Then the third level moves up to talking about being able to make medical claims. So this would now be able to say that your nutraceutical can be used in the treatment of a specific health condition. And this would put you at the same level of rigor that's required for a pharmaceutical drug, where you would need to basically invest in doing clinical studies and toxicology studies before you would be able to make those medical claims. But to put it into context, there are a good number and a very rapidly increasing number of nutraceuticals that have got clinical studies and are now able to make medical claims. So then looking at um, pharmaceuticals. With pharmaceuticals, we know that 18%, um, as we said, of pharmaceuticals are derived from natural products. So there's a significant opportunity where, through traditional knowledge, we've identified a particular plant, we've identified the key phytochemicals in that plant. That's a great opportunity to then take those phytochemicals and to take them down the drug discovery route. The challenge with the pharmaceuticals, which is why they're not a low-hanging fruit, is the time it takes to bring a drug to market, on average 10 to 15 years, and the cost. So the median cost is currently, and this is JAMA, uh, the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association published research this year to show the median cost for drink, bringing a, a pharmaceutical drug to market is 985 million US dollars. Okay, I said I'd talk about the importance of pharmacopoeias. So a definition of pharmacopoeia is a legally binding collection of standards and quality specifications for medicines used in a country or region. That's the WHO definition. And in talking about pharmacopoeias, to put that into some kind of context, China and India are the biggest exporters of nutraceuticals. Um, so China, in its um, national pharmacopoeia, has over 2,000 monographs for plants, fungal, animal, and mineral preparations where it lists the source of those uh, natural products, how they're identified, how they're prepared, what are the key health problems that they can be used to address, what the correct dosage is, and what are the, any of the cautions involved in taking them. In India, the National Pharmacopoeia lists 93 monographs. But in addition, in India, India has a 3,000-year history of traditional medicine, two forms, Ayurvedic medicine and Unami medicine. Both those traditional medical systems individually have their own national pharmacopoeias, which are uh, a very high proportion are made up of natural product um, monographs. If we look at the US, the official uh, US Pharmacopoeia Convention, the USP, contains over, four, sorry, over 800 monographs for nutraceutical, uh, nutraceuticals, and that's growing all the time. And um, with enforcement by the FDA, uh, that's used to um, manage basically the identity, the strength, the quality, and purity of both medicines and nutraceuticals in more than 140 countries. So before I finish this section, I wanted to also identify um, the launch of a new institute, the Institute of Sustainable Development. 
This is a collaboration that was launched uh, in January of this year. Um, this is a collaboration between the University of the West Indies and the U University of Havana in Cuba. And what's particularly interesting and very exciting about this new collaboration is a key part of that collaboration will look at research and development of natural products to help address health challenges impacting the Caribbean region. And given, as we talked about earlier, Cuba's um, advanced stage in terms of their development of natural products and their integration into their healthcare system, this is a very exciting new initiative between the two uh, institutions. So let's look at the Jamaican surveys, what Jamaicans tell us that they use natural products for on a day-to-day -day basis. So based on the Trammell survey that we undertook, um, Jamaicans told us 78% uh, of people who use medicinal plants are using those plants for conditions that affect the respiratory system. So these are your standard um, bush, uh, cold bush remedies. And by cold bush, I mean, you know, the use of botanicals, whether you call it botanicals, bush medicine, herbal medicine, phytomedicine. Generally, it's the use of bush medicine. So 78% for respiratory system, 53% for uh, illnesses or, or issues affecting the, the GI tract, the digestive tract. So these would be things like diarrhea, constipation, bellyache, gas. Interestingly, in the Jamaican context, 30% of respondents said they used uh, medicinal plants proactively, not to treat illness, but to actually maintain health. And this is very, very interesting from a health perspective because this shows a very proactive approach of medicinal plant use to stay healthy. And the rest of the list goes on. But if I focus now on those um, medicinal plants that people identified in the use of, um, in the respiratory system, the top 10 plants that people identified are here. And by far and ab above the two Key plants are leaf of life and jack in the bush, the scientific name Calancho penata and Chromalina odorata. So what I, what I want to do is look at some of the clinical studies that exist for these plants. In fact, do clinical studies exist for any of these plants? <clears throat> and the answer to that is yes, actually out of those 10 plants, five plants have been through some type of clinical study. So if we look at just some of those clinical studies, so, for example, with Calancho penatum, leaf of life. Um, leaf of life is actually used as what's called a tocolytic agent and has been for 15 years in German clinics. It's given both intravenously, uh, uh, in directly into the bloodstream, and taken orally. In women that are about to go into premature labor, a tocolytic is something that slows down or prevents uterine contractions. The pharmaceutical tocolytics tend to come with um, a lot of side effects. What they found in clinical studies was that leaf of life actually is as effective as, as a pharmaceutical drug, but without the toxicity or the side effects. Also, in clinical studies, it's been shown to be effective in the treatment of overactive bladder in postmenopausal women, and also shown effective in the treatment of sleeplessness in pregnant women. Looking at Susumba, uh, so Sumba has been through clinical studies for diabetes, but it was not found through these initial clinical studies to be effective in the treatment of, of blood sugar levels. Probably more research is required there. But it has been, through clinical studies, found to be effective in combination with three other plants in a combination medicine in the treatment of malaria in children. Uh, garlic, perhaps not surprisingly, garlic is very well known for its health benefits. Over 100 clinical studies to date, including for its use in protecting and supporting cardiovascular health and immune function. And in the brief review I did, I found eight clinical studies for the common cold. Uh, most of those have not yet proved um, conclusive, but obviously we need to do more research on garlic in the use of the common cold. Uh, citrus aurotium, also known in Jamaica as seville orange or bitter orange, 16 clinical studies showing it's effective um, for weight loss, particularly one of the key phytochemicals, p cinnidifrin. And then lastly, uh, coconut, particularly coconut oil. There's been some very interesting clinical studies to show the potential role of coconut oil 
both in the prevention and early stage treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Also, interestingly, clinical studies have, uh, a number of clinical studies have said that coconut oil has been shown to reduce abdominal obesity, to lead to weight loss, uh, reduce body fat, and to optimize HDL, which is the good cholesterol, um, refer to good cholesterol. In terms now, so moving now on to um, an area of clinical studies I wanted to talk about, which looks at uh, reverse pharmacology. So this is um, a clinical study that was done in Mali. So this was done with the approval of the Malian government and with WHO approval. Uh, it came with EU funding, European Union funding, and it was a collaboration between a number of research teams, but uh, predominantly a research team from the University of Oxford and a research team from the University of Lucerne in Switzerland. So what the research term did was that they started by working with um, the traditional healers in rural communities. And in fact, the traditional healers were part of an intrinsic part of the research team. So working with those traditional healers, they shortlisted four or five medicinal plants that the healers were using for the treatment of uncomplicated malaria in children. They ended up shortlisting one plant, and that's the plant that's shown here held by the traditional healer. Uh, called Arjamin Mexicana, also known, and it's found in Jamaica, lo known locally in Jamaica as Holy Thistle or Blessed Thistle. So what they started off by doing was, this was a traditional medicine that had got years and years and years of traditional use and had shown safe use in human beings. But in order to ensure that that safety could be shown in a clinical, preclinical setting, they did animal studies to confirm um, that there was no toxicity. So they're moving, um, but one part of the plant actually is toxic, the seed. So one of the, the added values that the researchers were able to do was to work with the traditional healers to ensure that the seeds were excluded from their preparation of their traditional medicines. So they then initially did a clinical study with those children that were taking uh, the traditional preparation, and through that initial clinical study, they were able to identify the safest and most effective dose of that traditionally prepared um, medicine. Then having done that work, they then moved on to the randomized clinical trial, where one group of children were treated with that traditional medicine prepared by the traditional healers, and then a second group of children were treated with a standard pharmaceutical treatment for malaria. Now the final part of the research protocol was having completed the clinical studies was to then identify well what are the phytochemicals in that traditional medicine that were giving rise to the anti-malarial properties. And by identifying those key phytochemicals they were able to standardize and help support the traditional healers to, to standardize and ensure quality control in their local produced herbal medicine. They were then able to take that information and then start to develop the product as a nutraceutical. So instead of the local medicine only being available, say, rurally in that community, you can now start to expand its use into other communities, urban communities, and then potentially into other countries as well. And then in addition, having identified those key phytochemicals, those key phytochemicals can then be taken down the drug discovery route to that longer term potential development of a new pharmaceutical for the treatment of malaria. So what were the results? So here are the results. 90%, nearly 90%, 89.3% showed efficacy against malaria in children compared to the pharmaceutical drug that came in at 95% efficacy. The pink columns show where you get um, <coughs> remission, so the children who had been treated then had a, a flare-up of malaria and had to be treated a second time. So the flare-ups occurred in about 10% of those treated with the pharmaceutical drugs and about 13% of those treated with the traditional medicine. When we look at the cost per episode of malaria, what you see is a huge very, very significant difference between the cost of the pharmaceutical and the cost of preparing a locally produced herbal medicine. 
So what were the lessons that the researchers learned from this reverse uh, pharmacology approach? They were able to show that the efficacy and safety uh, of the traditional prepared medicine was comparable to the standard pharmaceutical drug. They were able to show that this traditional phytomedicine could go through a rapid development uh, to come up with an improved traditional medicine in comparison to 10 to 15 years for a pharmaceutical drug to be developed. They were able to show that the cost of doing this type of research in comparison to the cost of a pharmaceutical drug development is incredibly low. This whole project cost around 500,000 uh, 500, uh, US dollars. And what they were also able to show was that the end product was unbelievably affordable and immediately available. And most importantly, they were able to show that the phytomedicine in its traditional form could be developed in parallel with conventional drug development. So in conclusion, um, what we've shown, what hopefully I've talked about is that there are currently no silver bullets, uh, no silver bullet solutions, but that natural products can significantly benefit national development and national health security. That opportunities exist on these three levels that we've talked about. Uh, the enhanced use of traditional medicines at a community level. The development from that traditional use of nutraceutical products that can be then used at a, both a local level across the, the, the nation, but also then regionally and internationally and that the, the longer-term development of pharmaceutical drugs is also a possibility from this type of research. What we know, though, is that critical to the success of this type of approach is an equitable collaboration with traditional knowledge holders and with community members who are the owners of this traditional knowledge. It requires an investment in research um, and development. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Picking. The science you discussed is so precious to Jamaicans. It's the kind of science I know most Jamaicans can relate to. So we thank you for explaining the process to take nutraceuticals, the low-hanging fruits, and pharmaceuticals, the higher fruits, to market, and for showing us the connection between science, culture, and business. This is important for all of us as Jamaica explores the potential of our natural products in healthcare and in particular in this fight against COVID-19. Now, we've been told that the upcoming section was the favorite section of our viewers in forums one and two. Yes, it is time for tackling COVID misconceptions. So we invite Dr. Louis Ray Harris to do some myth-busting, ladies and gentlemen, myth-busting about 5G and COVID. But before he comes, I tell you a little bit about Dr. Louis Ray Harris. Dr. Louis Ray Harris lectures courses in electronics and telecommunications in the Department of Physics here in FSD. He has a background in electrical and computer engineering, and holds a PhD in wireless communications. His current research includes radio frequency propagation in indoor and outdoor environments, wireless device use, and various aspects of human health, Internet of Things applications, and satellite communication systems. This afternoon, Dr. Harris will be speaking on the topic Coronavirus and 5G. Is there a connection? Thank you, Dr. Singh Wilmot. Good afternoon. My name is Louis Ray Harris. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Physics at the University of the West Indies. Today, I'm going to be speaking with you on the topic tackling COVID-19 misconceptions. Coronavirus and 5G, is there a connection? Well, to start, let's go back to the 3rd of January 2020, when there had been reports coming out of Wuhan in China about a mysterious virus. The authorities in China had launched an investigation to determine what was the cause of this mysterious pneumonia. It had been affecting dozens of people, 
and they were not sure what was the cause. Fast forward to January 9, it was determined that this mysterious illness was caused by the coronavirus. Then it began to spread and other countries then began to take note and shut their borders as the case may be. Now, in a short while, there were then social media rumors that came up. Uh, the most popular ones were that Bill Gates had created this virus. And 5G actually was the cause of COVID-19. There are some others that say that 5G is actually a bioweapon and that there are some other um, others related to, for instance, colloidal silver being a cure, ibuprofen being dangerous to take, and so on. And these uh, conspiracy theories thrived with the way that social media has been um, propagates. And um, soon after that, picking up from the 5G conspiracy, um, some cell providers in Europe began to report that their mass, their cellular mass were being burnt. And it was believed that this was because of persons who were of the impression that 5G's installation in those countries would make them more likely to catch the coronavirus. So there were different mass attacks. April, um, there were some reports on the BBC. Um, there was support in even Belgium where um, this diagram shows a fire that had burnt, um, significantly damaged um, one of the, the antennas, 5G antennas. Closer to home, the local providers, Digicel and Flow, began to report that there were, their infrastructure had been damaged and that um, some of it incurred costs of up to several millions of dollars. In South America, one village in Peru, whose infrastructure was about to be um, repaired by some technicians, they, their villagers kidnapped the technicians because they were afraid that they were going to be installing 5G antennas, which would then cause them to become infected by coronavirus. Back in the UK, talk show hosts made some comments that were deemed to be irresponsible by the regulator in that country, the Ofcom. And um, there were some other scientists who branded 5G claims as complete rubbish um, because it was widely accepted, at least in the scientific community, that um, there was no correlation between the two. Coming back to Jamaica, the OUR, the regulator in Jamaica, they released a statement that says, um, as the regulator of the telecommunications sector, the OUR advises that currently there is no deployment of 5G technology in Jamaica. As well, none of the existing mobile te telecommunication providers has advised of any definite plans for the immediate implementation of this technology." End quote. In addition, the Spectrum Regulator, the Spectrum Management Authority, released a statement. And um, in that statement, it also specified clearly that there has been no 5G assignment in Jamaica. And they, are, they have received no application with respect to the operation of any 5G technologies and consequently has not made any recommendation to MSET regarding same. Finally, one of the providers, Flo, they released a statement, a joint statement actually with Digicel, which indicated that neither Flo nor Digicel have deployed any 5G infrastructure on their mobile towers to date. And any reports to the contrary are absolutely false. So what are those claims? Well, the first claim, coronavirus was caused by 5G technology. And what I'm going to do in the next few slides is to look at this claim, look at the reason for it, and try to answer it. So first, let's look. When was 5G developed? Now to answer this, I will first start by looking at what is 5G. 
Now, 5G is the fifth generation of mobile broadband technology that's being developed in order to replace or augment existing 4G LTE connections. It's expected that 5G will have much faster download and upload speeds. And with 5G, the time that's taken for devices to communicate with each other and with wireless networks will significantly decrease. Now, the fact that there's a 5G means that there must have been something before it. And going back to 1G, which was in the 1980s, um, in the, initially there was the, the devices were just capable of providing analog voice calls. And there was some mob, so with mobile connectivity. So that was all that they were able to do. In the next decade, 2G came along. And in that, the upgrade from 1G was the ability to have basic text messaging, so your SMS became a reality, um, basic data services, and digital voice calls. Then in the early 2000s, there was the introduction of mobile broadband with smartphones being able to send both images and video. This was a revolution and many persons enjoy the benefits that it brought. However, there became the need that, there became the need for um, a much faster mobile broadband technology that used internet protocol, which would allow all of the mobile devices to talk with each other to talk with the network um, using IP. And that is, so that was in on 2010. Simultaneously, while the mobile wireless evolution was taking place, there was also a wireless LAN evolution. That's local area networks. So the Wi-Fi protocols and standards were being developed. So you had, there were 1G, 2G, 3, 4, and 5G uh, standards as well that were also evolving at the same time as the mobile wireless technologies. And it should be noted that in between these decades, there was a phased introduction of the technologies as the next standard became um, agreed upon. So even though the 5G standard has not been fully determined and uh, had not been fully agreed upon until very recently, Many aspects of it had been signed off on and had been introduced at to varying degrees in different countries. And the justification for 5G development, well, the projection back in 2011 was for dramatic increases in the monthly data traffic, increases of more than 30% compound annual growth rate in the per subscriber traffic by users of smartphones, tablets, and laptops, Remember, this was a decade when your images and your video became um, a reality. And so uh, that was taking off exponentially. Cellular networks became the primary platform for connecting everything to everyone. And there was also the projection that the Internet of Things, machine to machine and vehicle to vehicle or V2V communications would become uh, much more of a reality. The predictions for 2020 at the time were that there would be more than 20 billion connected Internet of Things devices. So there began to be talk about things like enhanced mobile broadband, EMBB, which would have peak um, data rates of 10 to 20 gigabits per second. Um, the traffic, it would allow 10,000 times more traffic than the previous generation. Um, energy savings would be realized. It would allow applications like virtual reality, augmented reality. There was also massive machine communication, MMTC, which would allow a large number of devices like meters, um, smartphones, your watches, your visors, your, even your wind turbines. Everything would be able to connect to the network. Um, so there will be long-range um, communications, a high density of devices, several tens of thousands per square kilometer. We have very lo low data rates also will be supported for sensor applications especially. The battery life will be very large very, and um, there will be asynchronous access. There's also ultra-reliability and low latency, URLL, 
which would really allow applications such as vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. So your cars would be speaking to each other on the road, so there'd be collision detection. Um, there would also be driverless cars, remote surgeries. All this would become reality. And that was a projection back in 2011, one of the justifications for the development of 5G technology. So as I mentioned, in between the decade, there were some developments and um, phase introductions. So from as far back as 2017, there were some um, initial deployments um, in um, the US, in Korea. There were some an official launch in, of the commercial services in South Korea um, in 2018 on one of the frequency bands. Italy, um, Germany, and other European countries over the, over the period 2017 to 2019, they introduced in some form 5G technology. So by last year, 2019, they had over 50 operators had launched 5G services worldwide. Um, the service providers deploy, had deployed more than 200,000 new 5G sub-6 gigahertz base stations, and the relatively small coverage areas that, that were needed, or that are needed for 5G, would um, lead to it being introduced in um, some major city centers um, where there's a larger number of users present. So in response to the first claim, is coronavirus caused by 5G technology? This one, you see, 5G was around for some time before the emergence of COVID-19, so this one, we can say, is a myth. The second claim, electromagnetic waves are responsible for the spread or propagation of coronavirus, as opposed to causing it. Um, this one came about because of um, some concerns related to the, the distance that the 5G antennas would be to the end users. So looking at the picture on the left, that's the image of a traditional base station. And traditionally, you'd have one base station that would cover a large area, um, and that would communicate with all mobile devices in that area. But as 5G, became more of a reality, it became obvious that there would be a need for many smaller base stations. And so we move from the, the idea of the macro cell to the pico cell and the femto cells. And so there were distributed antennas. And the reason for this is because there were many more devices within a given area that needed to connect. And so it would be more, make more sense economically to have smaller base stations that would co each cover a small subset of that large cell. So we had what we call the HET net or heterogeneous cellular network being developed. So the pros and cons, the traditional base station, there's higher capital expenditure, higher operating expenditure, and there were cell site restrictions. So we had to find a plot of land that was large enough to host this tower that would have its own power supply. Um, it would be a secure site, has to maintain a certain distance between itself and any nearby residential areas. And then you have this concept of the 5G antenna, which is smaller. It has a lower deployment cost, a smaller transmit power, and its organic capacity-driven deployments would then become possible. So having a smaller antenna would allow you to better and more easily extend the coverage and to add capacity. So if you have new users coming into a certain area or a set of devices coming in, then you will have um, greater ability to just add a small antenna to that particular area and you have your increased capacity. So with this then becoming a reality, we have 5G antennas that could be mounted on the sides of buildings. Um, on cars, in stadia, on traffic lights, on trains, drones. Um, everything would be able to talk to everything else because there are so many access points around the city. And this is mobile technology. And the number of 5G antennas, therefore, would be much higher than that of 2, 3, and even 4G 
antennas. And so because of that, persons were concerned that all that radio frequency um, signals that would be around would result in um, the coronavirus being um, propagated. But here we see the electromagnetic spectrum, which shows right at the top the, the region that, in which radio waves generally um, exist. So we have the wavelengths of the radio waves that vary from around 10 centimeters to one meter. That's the radio waves that are used for the mobile band. And we have the virus having a size of approximately 0.1 micrometer. So compared to the wavelength of the, the radio wave, the virus is several orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelength of the radio frequency. And as a result, it is impossible for the wave to carry the virus as such. Um, in addition, just for comparison, we see that the coronavirus, as I mentioned, is 0.1 micrometer. And compared with the red blood cell, which is 7 micrometer, or even PM10, particulate matter, 10 micrometers, um, we, it is really very, very small. Now, waves, how do these waves operate? The waves are caused by disturbances that transport energy away from a source. Waves transport energy and information. They do not transfer matter. There are different types of waves, mechanical waves such as seismic waves, sound waves, which require a physical medium. But electromagnetic waves, which really is the type of wave that we're talking about, the RF signals, they do not require medium. So you can have RF signals that are going through space where there's no air, um, um, visible light, X-rays. These are all examples of electromagnetic waves. And so there's no physical boundary between the waves and the objects, so, such as um, the coronavirus. So there's no way that they can actually um, cause the virus to propel or be, propagate in a particular direction. And I show this picture to give the example of the Mexican wave. Um, in a stadium, a Mexican wave is caused by persons going up and down, and then as the as it goes around the, the, the stands, then it's really the, the wave motion appearance is, is created. The individual persons do not actually move along the direction of the wave. It is the, the motion of the wave that moves. So in the same way, the coronavirus is not moved around, along the path of a wave. Okay? So that is the that's an answer to the second claim that um, electromagnetic waves are responsible for the spread of coronavirus. And in response, as I said, they transmit only information and energy, but not matter. So the third and final claim I would just want to address here, but don't the specific frequencies used by 5G make it different from other mobile technologies with respect to coronavirus propagation? In other words, even though we have established that EM waves cannot propagate mat uh, matter. Isn't 5G different? They use different, don't they use different frequencies? And the answer is the yes, they use different frequencies. However, let's look at the assignment of those frequencies. The International Telecommunications Union, which is a body that exists under the United Nations, um, they govern the assignment and allocation of electromagnetic spectrum frequencies for use by entities worldwide. So the radio stations, your TV stations, your cellular providers, etc. all of them have to operate on frequencies that have been assigned to them by the ITU through local regulators in individual countries. Now Jamaica is in region two, which is America's region and also has the, the US, uh, which has the FCC as its regulator. So many of the decisions that are made by the FCC also affect other countries in this region. And the FCC has specified on um, the low and mid-band frequency spectrum um, for 5G um, to be 
between six to 900 megahertz and in the three gigahertz band. Uh, for the six to 900 megahertz band is useful for wider coverage. It allows longer, greater range. The mid band spectrum allows a balance between the coverage and greater capacity. And the diagram on the right shows two waveforms. One has a low frequency, one has a high frequency. The low frequency one has a longer wavelength, which is the distance between adjacent peaks, whereas a high frequency one has shorter wavelengths. So more oscillations are completed per unit time with the high frequency um, signals. So with the high band spectrum, um, based on the FCC's um, actions, this, the ones, sorry, with the high band spectrum, based on the FCC, uh, actions. It's best for high capacity applications, extends from 24 gigahertz upwards, that's 24 by 10 to the nine um, times per second. The wavelengths therefore vary from one to 10 millimeters, which is why they're called millimeter waves. And this is um, much smaller compared to the wavelengths of existing smartphones other wireless devices, which are several tens of centimeters. Up to now, the primary use of millimeter wave band has been for satellites and radar systems. And just to give you a, a comparison, the lower band, which you see on the left there, that is equivalent to the uh, highway that has uh, a dual carriageway, which only has two lanes in each direction. Um, when you look on the right, you see a highway with six lanes in each direction. Um, that is really aimed at showing you the increased capacity that you can get when you use the high band spectrum as opposed to the low or mid band spectra. So therefore a lot more data traffic can flow in the high band spectra. So that is why it's so attractive and which makes it different from the frequencies used for the two, three and four G technologies. In some countries to date, they have already assigned the, as a spectrum, the three gigahertz band, the four gigahertz band. Um, so we see China, the EU, US, Japan, South Korea, there have been different um, bands and sub-bands that have been assigned. Um, and in the 26 or 28, gigahertz band, there are also some that have been assigned by each of the countries, although not all of them have yet been implemented in their actual infrastructure. So can these low and mid-band spectra propagate coronavirus? Well, in the low frequency bands, many of those frequencies are of set the same order of magnitude or similar order of magnitude when compared to existing wireless technologies, um, such as the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and cordless phones. So if it is that those frequencies would propagate coronavirus, then it is reasonable to assume that it would already have been propagated because there are other devices that use those frequencies. What about the high frequency um, band? Well, it's relatively new. Its application, application is relatively new. And um, although plans have been developed for its use, there's very limited implementation worldwide. In addition to that, where exactly do we find coronavirus spreading? Well, up to this week, based on the map, we see that coronavirus is virtually in all countries worldwide, including countries that have not yet implemented 5G. In fact, the majority of them have not implemented 5G. And the majority of them, well, quite a number of them may not even have 4G technology as yet. So this essentially um, show, goes to show that um, the coronavirus cannot be spread by the higher frequencies of 5G. And just to show, um, the WHO has released a fact flyer which states Viruses cannot travel on radio waves or mobile networks. COVID-19 is spreading in many countries that do not have 5G mobile networks. So according to WHO, coronavirus is not spread by 5G.
Interestingly, could coronavirus actually help to increase the global spread of 5G technology, which from a strictly technical perspective was actually developed to enhance communication between multiple sensor devices. So as opposed to 5G actually causing the propagation of coronavirus, what if the presence of coronavirus actually increased the need for a technology like 5G? So we live in a new norm where everyone is wearing masks, are supposed to be wearing masks, stores have thermal scanners, some places have visors, face shields. What if it's possible to have sensors on your masks which would communicate with your phones or with your visors if your breath is detected to have coronavirus? What if a thermal scanner detecting a temperature that's above a certain threshold could talk to a 5G antenna and say that this person needs to be checked? What if your, your, your mask could speak to a sensor in your car, which would then communicate to your phone and then communicate to your hospital to say that there is a possibility that this person has coronavirus? The communications infrastructure that would be needed to implement such an integrated system where every device is connected to every other device is something that can be realized using 5G technology. And if this is implemented for one person, it would be great. But suppose it's a requirement for everyone. Suppose everyone is required to wear masks that had sensors. Then definitely you could say that the coronavirus would have led to the need for sensors and a communications infrastructure pretty much like the one that we see in 5G. Food for thought. Thank you. I know you join me, ladies and gentlemen, in thanking Dr. Louis Ray Harris for clearing that up. We now know, everyone, that 5G has the potential to be more of a friend than a foe in this fight against COVID-19 and really can be useful in communicating, tracking, and just helping us to effectively cope with COVID-19 in our environment. Now, like the rest of the world, the economies of small island Caribbean states like Jamaica are suffering tremendously from the negative impacts of this pandemic. And with the recent spike in cases, our concerns have heightened as the impact is being felt at the dinner tables of every single Jamaican. In charting the way forward, we must therefore follow the science. And for this, we turn to Dr. Peter John Gordon. Peter John Gordon is an economist who studied economics at the University of the West Indies, Mona, at the BSc and MSc levels, and Boston University at the PhD level. He currently lectures in the Department of Economics at the UE Mona's campus. He's a visiting research fellow at, at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, and has also worked with the Planning Institute of Jamaica, where he was the Director of Economic Planning and Research. Dr. Gordon served as the Chairman of the Maritime Authority of Jamaica, Chairman and a Commissioner of the Fair Trading Commission, and Deputy Chairman of the Advisor Board of the Productivity Center. He has also served as a Director of the Statistical Institute of Jamaica and the National Investment Bank of Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Peter John Gordon on the topic, Economic Fallout, Following the Science in COVID-19 Pandemic. Dr. Singh Wilmoth, moderator, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this uh, forum. Uh, today I'm gonna speak a little bit about the economic response to COVID-19. As you are all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge economic impact on all countries around the globe. 
there has not been any aspect of life which has been untouched. Which means that the economy has been affected through many different channels. The pandemic has not only affected overall economic activity, but has had different impacts on different segments of the population, which will lead to a deterioration of income and wealth distribution with all the challenges which those pose. Usually, when there is a disaster in one part of the world, it is possible for other parts of the world to render some assistance, a sort of insurance plan. However, when all countries are affected, the capacity of countries to offer assistance to others is greatly reduced. The IMF has already responded to 102 countries for emergency funding so far since March 2020, committing approximately 100 billion US dollars. The fund is making 250 billion US dollars, a quarter of its lending capacity available to member countries. Jamaica had 520 million US dollars in assistance approved on March 15. The government of Jamaica is also engaging with other multilateral institutions such as the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank for financial assistance. Economic activity has been greatly curtailed by the pandemic, which has affected incomes of individuals as well as the tax revenues of governments. It is true that Jamaica's quarterly GDP has been declining before the onset of the pandemic, moving from 1.7% growth in the first quarter of 2019 to 1.3% in the second quarter to 0.6% in the third quarter and then zero in the fourth quarter. However, the onset of the pandemic has resulted in GDP for the first quarter of 2020 falling by 2.3%. Recall that we did not shut down until the third week of March. The outbreak of COVID-19 in the USA and other countries did cause a slowdown in tourism for the first quarter of this year, and that would have had a knock-on effect. The major downturn in the economy is expected to be felt in the second quarter of this year. The PIOJ is expecting Q2 GDP to fall by between 12 and 14%. It is anticipated that the economy should contract by between 4 and 6% for the fiscal year. The US has just announced that its economy shrank by 9.6% during the April to June quarter. And Germany has also just re reported a 10.2% decline. It is expected that Jamaica will experience the worst annual economic decline in the last 40 years. The IMF, the PIOJ, and the BOJ are all projecting that barring no other shocks and a recovery of the world economy in 2122, and if the local tourism sector recovers in 2223, Jamaica will attain pre COVID 19 levels of economic output by March 2023. Since government revenue is a fraction of economic activity, as the economic 
activity declines, the revenue flowing into the government's coffers would also decrease. The Minister of Finance and the Public Service estimates that for the financial year 2021, revenues will be approximately 81 billion Jamaican dollars below the approved estimates. It is anticipated that other inflows will be lower by 5 billion Jamaican dollars, while expenditure will increase by 34 billion dollars. So the COVID situation will cost the government of Jamaica 120 billion Jamaican dollars. The primary fiscal surplus target for 2021 has been relaxed from 5.4% of GDP to 3.5% to accommodate the emergency expenditure. In fact, the target of reaching a debt to GDP ratio of 60% has been pushed back by two years to 27-28. Preliminary data suggest that government revenues for May 2020 was 27% below budget. There are three broad tax categories. Income and profit taxes is the first, production and consumption taxes the second, and the third being border and related taxes, which would include import duties, tourism taxes, and any other tax which deals with cross-border transactions. This latter category usually accounts for 40% of total taxes, and it declined by 44% in May. The tourism sector has been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. This sector is expected to contract by 85% in the second quarter of this year. Jamaica's three major sources of foreign exchange are tourism, remittances, and global services and business outsourcing. It is anticipated that foreign exchange earnings will decline by two billion US dollars during the fiscal year. Interestingly, we haven't yet seen a fall off in remittances. In fact, there was approximately 5.5% increase between March and June. The global slowdown in economic activity has resulted in a fall in international oil prices actually becoming negative at one point. Jamaica is expected to spend 700 million US dollars less this year on oil. In spite of this, the current account deficit is expected to move from 2.3% of GDP to between 6.5 and 7% of GDP during this fiscal year. Reduced economic activity also results in a decline in the demand for labor. We can therefore expect a significant increase in the next set of unemployment figures, which would be for March 2020. The Ministry of Tourism indicates that at least 50,000 direct employees have been laid off in the hotel sector as well as tens of thousands more in other subsectors of the tourism sector. The business processing outsourcing sector has shed approximately 6,000 jobs already. Because of COVID-19, the employed labor force is likely to decline by in excess of 100,000. A Don Anderson poll done between July 15 and 20, found that 56% of respondents confirmed that their standard of living has decreased due to COVID-19. Disruptions in the day-to-day -day activities have had serious implications for some of our social sectors. 
Schools had to be closed with a shift to online teaching. Many claim that this is the future. Online teaching is, however, a very poor substitute for face-to-face -face teaching, especially among younger children. The shift to online education exposed a di digital divide which existed in the country. Not all students were able to access online classes because of a lack of computer equipment or internet connectivity. The country is not 100% blanketed with internet connection. Combined with these problems, we also had to add interruption in electricity supply. An often overlooked issue is the ability of caregivers at home to help students with online learning. Some parents are required to leave the home for work, therefore are not available to supervise and assist their children, particularly the younger ones, with online classes. Some parents, even if they are home, are unable to help with the education process because of their own levels of education. In many instances, even if parents are available and willing, there is usually only one computer for multiple children whose classes are all taking place simultaneously. Therefore, not all can participate consistently. All of these challenges mean that the very unequal education system is made even more unequal by a sudden need to move outside of a physical space for education. We can speak of a digital divide or an education divide or an access divide, but in the end, it is an income divide with the relatively more affluent children having access to education and the rest being left behind. An interesting question is if the gap exacerbated by this digital divide can be narrowed or reversed when normality returns. Or will this situation simply increase the intergenerational income and wealth inequality? Fortunately, our health system has not come under extreme pressure from the virus so far. We know that our healthcare system comes under tremendous pressure in normal times. Would we be able to deal with 200 persons or even 100 persons in Kingston requiring ICU treatment at the same time? What happens as we move outside of Kingston? There has been a move to working from home. This mode of operation is only suitable for some types of jobs. Jobs such as manufacturing, public transportation, agriculture, and law enforcement cannot be done remotely. A stay-at-home order would reduce activities in these areas with temporary or even permanent displacement and loss of income. Those who can work remotely are more likely to keep their jobs, thus increasing the income inequality between those who can work remotely and those who can't. Interestingly, many of the jobs which can be done remotely are done by people with higher levels of education. And many of those which require a physical presence are done by 
people without higher education. How much of the economic downturn is due to supply shock and how much is due to demand shock? Would the government declaring that the economy is open in fact lead to increased economic activity? Interestingly, two professors from Chicago Booth School at the University of Chicago, Austin Goolsby and Chad Savison, in a recent paper presented at the National Bureau of Economic Research Summer Institute entitled Fair, Lockdowns, and Division, comparing the drivers of pandemic economic decline gives us some insight into this question. They are investigating how much of the COVID-19 economic collapse was driven by policy and how much from individual fear. They had access to GPS data from cell phones so that they were able to track movements of persons. They looked at visits to businesses in the same metro area during the same week, but across state borders where there were different policies. They were able to track weekly consumer visits to 2.25 million businesses spanning 110 industries. They excluded nonprofits, manufacturing, and other businesses where consumer visits is not a measure of economic activity. Visits to stores dropped by 60% between January and April, which match closely huge rises in unemployment and reduced credit card activity. The metro area covered Brock Island, Moline, and East Moline on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River, and Davenport and Bettendorf on the Iowa side. Illinois had a stay-at-home order, while Iowa did not. They observed that there was a fall of 76% visits to beauty salons on the Illinois side of the river and a 69% fall on the Iowa side. They concluded that the stay-at-home order did not account for a fall of 76% in visits to beauty salons but rather only 7%. They also looked across time at the same place, which at one time had a stay-at-home order and at another time had no such order. The stay-at-home order accounted for only 8% decline in visits. They further report on places which lift their stay-at-home orders and saw only a 5% rise in commercial visits. They therefore concluded that it is fear of the virus rather than government policy which is driving the economic collapse. They report some other interesting findings. One, that while all commercial visits decline, the decline was greater to those activities which were deemed to be non-essential. Two, visits to restaurants and bars fell by about the same as increases to non-restaurant food and beverage stores. Three, consumers seem to be substituting smaller retailers for larger ones, where more people would gather. And four, decline visits were larger, the larger the reports of contraction, hospitalization, and death within an area. These findings indicate that the ability of the government by policy to command the restart of economic activity is limited. Consumers are reacting to the pandemic independently of government policy. There are therefore demand shocks at work and not simply supply shocks in response to public policy. The implications are that 
economic activities will be greatly affected by how safe people feel to participate in such activities. The Jamaican government has reopened tourism sector. An interesting question, still unanswered, is how fearful will tourists and workers be? And what impact will those fears have? Many governments have sought to support persons and entities whose incomes have been reduced. This is sometimes called a stimulus package. But this is really a relief package. The government of Jamaica's economic policy response has included what it calls a 31 billion Jamaican dollar stimulus consisting of approximately 15 billion dollars Jamaican in tax cuts and spending stimulus of 16 billion Jamaican dollars. In addition, health expenditure of 6 billion and public bodies support of 3 billion totaling approximately 40 billion Jamaican dollars. These spendings are not likely to stimulate additional economic activity, although it may prevent further decline. The fear of interacting with the virus is spreading and is likely to be a significant drag on economic activity. Normally, a government engaging in stimulus spending hopes that the increased economic activity would result in an increase in revenue flows to the government. In the time of COVID, there is not likely to be an increase in economic activity which will generate additional government revenue. So increased government spending for relief is likely to increase the government's deficit both in the short and the long run. Now, the virus has also unearthed some phenomena which on the surface looks quite bizarre but have quite rational economic explanations. In the US, it was noted that the lockdown resulted in a shortage of toilet paper. The COVID virus was not expected to lead to excessive diarrhea. So why were people trying to stock up on toilet paper when asked to stay home? Some journalists investigated and discovered a possible explanation. Approximately 40% of bathroom use in the US is away from home. The toilet paper used at home in the US is very different from the industrial type usually found in offices, airports, etc. With a stay-at-home order, bathroom use at home increased significantly and so too the demand for home toilet paper. Unfortunately, home toilet bathrooms are not equipped to use industrial toilet paper. And manufacturers of industrial toilet paper cannot easily shift to make home toilet paper without additional spending. If this spending is significant and the manufacturers are uncertain as to the length of time in which there would exist this additional demand, they would not be willing to make the investment necessary. Likewise, the manufacturers of home toilet paper are unwilling to make additional investments if they are unsure of the time horizon involved. This resulted in an increase in demand for home toilet paper without a commensurate increase in its supply, hence a shortage. Standard economic principles should dictate that there should be a rise in the price so as to provide an incentive for making the required investment to meet this demand. But this would be seen by many as price gouging and many societies frown on this. We did not experience a toilet paper shortage in Jamaica because the toilet paper used at home is very similar to the one used outside the homes. So there was no great difficulty in shifting from outside the home use to home use. We did, however, 
experience similar types of problems in our food distribution. Much of the output of the agricultural sector is aimed at the industrial market, hotels, schools, etc. The packaging required for this market segment is very different from the retail market, supermarkets. Hotels buying in bulk do not require retail packaging and labeling. The closure of the industrial market for agricultural products meant that it was very difficult for those products to be shifted into supermarkets. The TV news had many stories of farmers with pigs, chicken, and eggs, which could not sell because of the closure of hotels and schools. There were many voices calling for the banning of imported foodstuff since Jamaican farmers had unsold products on their hands. Again, the difficulty was that these farmers were not equipped to prepare their products for the retail market. To do so would require additional expenditure, which would only make economic sense if the prices were allowed to rise. Supermarket chains also had to consider what is likely to happen to their supplies when hotels reopen. Will the local farmers abandon them for the more lucrative tourism sector? Would their foreign suppliers still be willing to do business with them after they had disrupted the supply chains? Consumers, of course, would not welcome any price increase, especially those who would have had their incomes greatly reduced. All around the world, in response to COVID-19 crisis, there are voices calling for localization of supply chains. This phenomenon started before the pandemic in economic nationalism, which was a strong political trend, a growing political trend, a call to roll back globalization, usually under the guise that globalization had been responsible for movements of jobs and wealth to other countries. The pandemic and the disruption of international supply chains with the closure of sea and airports have fueled this sentiment. Such calls are, however, misguided. Growth is fastest and more sustainable when we are limited only by the global market and not by individual national markets. And when we can source inputs from anywhere in the world. We can learn lessons from our forefathers. Observe rural vi villages. Churches built two to 300 years ago have very thick walls compared with other buildings. These churches were constructed with a secondary purpose in mind, a shelter in times of crisis, especially from extreme hurricanes which are likely to occur fairly infrequently. No attempt was made to build other buildings to the same specification. To do so would be prohibitively expensive and keep the community in a very poor state, even if they managed to do so. Their model was not to subjugate all activities to the possibility of a calamity but rather to have some kind of emergency plan, if needed, and to pursue a wider social and economic agenda. Seeking to localize our supply chain is akin to constructing all buildings with walls that are three feet thick. It is best for us to seek to advance our economic well-being as fast as possible, being fully aware that from time to time, we will face crises. Immediately, there needs to be significant new spending to support the education system in these difficult times. We have to put in place a technological infrastructure that would allow more equitable 
distance learning. It is not just equipping each student with a computer or tablet, but ensuring that there is broadband access which would allow that computer or tablet to be used in the educational process. In order to prevent social distancing, or to um, preserve, I should say, social distancing at schools, changes will have to be made. It might not be possible to accommodate the entire student body at school at the same time. Will there be a return to the shift system? Will there be a blend of some students in the classroom while others are online? What are the implications for teachers for a shift system or managing face-to-face -face and online learning simultaneously? We are trying to figure out the answers to these and other questions as we go along. There is no set playbook to guide us. Moving forward, we cannot simply wait for normality to return. What is clear is that solving or at least managing the health issues is vital for improved economic activity. We have no idea how long the crisis will last. We have to be prepared to live with government deficits larger than we would otherwise like to, but even here, there are limits. It is clear that sustaining a social safety net with some sort of income support for those who have been displaced is required. Our ability to do this is, however, much constrained. We have to engage in best practices for managing the virus and be willing to change as the science reveals new insights. Managing the virus means that more economic activity will be possible and less pressure on the healthcare system. Unfortunately, images which we see on TV from time to time of crowded marketplaces with little concern for social distancing and wearing of masks indicates that we have not all internalized the dangers which this virus poses not only to our livelihoods, but to our very lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. It is clear that we will have to be more strategic in the administration of stay-home orders if we are to keep the economy afloat and control the spread of COVID-19. And I thank you for taking the science to us. The 5% increase in remittances, though, is very telling. And it does confirm what we already know. We know that Jamaicans give back. Even when they too are suffering in a global pandemic like COVID, Jamaicans abroad take care of those of us at home. So right now, for all of you listening in the diaspora, we salute you in the fight against COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 has been disruptive. We have all had to adjust in one way or the other. We have had to change how we do things. And science and technology has largely facilitated this change. To examine how science is in action, redefining healthcare, I introduce Dr. Samantha Nicholson Spence. Dr. Samantha Nicholson Spence holds a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery from the University of the West Indies and a Doctor of Medicine in Internal Medicine from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She's a fellow in the American College of Physicians who now serves as a consultant and lecturer in the Department of Medicine here at the UWE. She was elected head of the Department of Internal Medicine at KPH in 2019 and continues to serve UWE and Jamaica with excellence. Please welcome Dr. Samantha Nicholson Spence to speak on the topic SNT in the post COVID world redefining healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Singh Wilmot. 
I'm Samantha Nicholson Spence, Associate Lecturer in the Department of Medicine here at the University of the West Indies. And I'm going to be talking about science and technology, how we are redefining healthcare in this post COVID world. Coronavirus has upended our world. Many of us have woken up to a new reality. Social distancing is now the norm. No longer are we bungling at the wholesale counter, shouting serve. Instead, we stand in orderly lines separated by markers on the ground. We must keep a six foot to two meter distance between each other. No more parties, no more mass gatherings. For the introverts, it's a very welcome reality. For everyone else, it's a nightmare that does not seem to be ending. There is now a rule. We must all wear a mask in public. For many, that is a very unwelcome reality as we think about not being able to see each other, not being able to experience the smiles that we have become so accustomed to. But nevertheless, this coronavirus is here, it is upon us, and now we must learn to adapt to this new reality. This new reality of Tanaya Yard. Here we see downtown Kingston, 7 p.m., deserted streets, subject to a curfew, something that we never thought we'd be able to see. But change is here, and it is now on us. Do we resist change or do we adapt? The answer is clear, we must adapt, because COVID is here. Do we sink or do we swim? Now, healthcare will always be here. People will always be sick and they will always be in need of good healthcare. The means by which we deliver this healthcare, that is the only element that is changing. Now, communication used to be face to face communication only. Nowadays, we welcome phone calls, WhatsApps, emails, and even our video calls, which has now become the norm. What we see now is more reliance on these alternative modes of communication rather than focusing on the face-to-face -face communication. Why just recently I had a patient send me a WhatsApp image of her mother's feet swollen for the past few days. She was able to say to me, Doc, look at mommy's feet, they're swollen. This was all in a voice note. I saw the picture to corroborate and I was able to say, okay, this is a change we're gonna make in the medication. Let's go ahead and increase your water tablets. Or we could do that by a simple WhatsApp communication. This is a type of instance as a patient who is in rural, who is in a rural community and does not have access to the subspecialist care that they need. What we find though, is that the telephone consultation, which has always been around, we're now increasingly using this as a means of consulting with our patients. It is a good means for doing your simple prescription refills and just to answer simple complaints. Doc, a slide, my ankle hurting me. I don't think it's brain. Prescribe something for me now. A simple prescription can be called in or even WhatsApp fax to the pharmacy and the patient's complaint can be taken care of. Now this sort of an arrangement works best for an established patient, but it's still useful in this sort of setting where we're limiting face-to-face -face consultation and crowding. The virtual consultation. Now the virtual consultation will facilitate a longer visit. Now we can actually inspect the complaint. So you say to me, doc, I wake up and there's this thing on my face. I can now look at the screen and see what's this thing on your face that you're speaking of. You can move and turn and tilt and show me from different angles. And I can come to a diagnosis and arrive at a treatment plan tailored to you. Now this sort of a consultation is particularly important, especially for patients who have mental health concerns. Because you can have this one-on-one -on -one consultation undivided attention, and we can visit what are your specific concerns. Is it depression? Is it anxiety? And we do know that the pandemic and its effects, the social distances, all the changes can also increase person's susceptibility to mental health disease. So it's important that this sort of modality is utilized in this way. And another thing that the virtual consultation will help that you may not have gotten from the phone conversation. Maybe you spoke to the patient and you say, Mr. Brown, are you taking your medications? Mr. Brown says yes. On a virtual consultation, you might be able to appreciate the downward gaze and the shift away to say that, hmm, maybe Mr. Brown really isn't taking the medication and you can use that as a cue to question him further to determine if there's really a compliance issue with medication use. 
Now, self-monitoring. Now, this is going to be very important, not just because there is a pandemic on board, but for the management of any patient. It's a two-way relationship. The patient must be invested in their own health care. If you have high blood pressure, get a blood pressure machine. Tell me your readings. Send them to me. Email, WhatsApp. If you have diabetes, you should have a glucometer. You should be measuring your sugars at home. And you should bring these to your appointments. For the virtual consultation or the telephone consultation, having that chart sent in advance can assist in better decision making and better patient care. Studies consistently show the patient who is invested in their health care and, and is doing these proactive measures will have a better outcome. We now have available point of care testing such as INR monitoring. Now certain patients with diseases that lead to a risk of blood clot take warfarin. Warfarin requires monitoring because we must ensure that the blood is neither too thin, in which case you could bleed, even fatally, or too thick, in which case you're not protected from blood clots and you could have a serious blood clot. Those blood tests are done on a monthly basis. Traditionally, that would involve the patient coming to the doctor, getting the forms, going to the lab, coming back every month. This sort of a social distancing protocol, this new norm, um, speaks against these frequent visits. So, by having a point of care machine, patients can now do it themselves. It's as simple as one takes their blood sugar and does a finger prick. Similar modality can be used to assess how thin, how thick the blood is to monitor warfarin therapy. And so all these visits can be done virtually without a face-to-face -face visit. There are no point of care machines to assess pulse oximetry. Now these have mainly been used by physicians and other healthcare providers, but they are available for patient use. And they can be particularly useful, especially in patients who have lung disease, where there may be concerns about oxygen level. In this photo, that nice white disc on that patient's arm is a monitor for continuous glucose monitoring. This is one of the newest innovations in diabetes management. Patients consistently complain about the finger pricks. They're painful. Nobody wants to stick themselves multiple times per day to check their blood sugar. Well, with continuous glucose monitoring, that device need only be placed once every two weeks. And that meter, you just wave it over the disc and you get an instant reading. The readings are recorded, graphed, and can be sent to an app. And this information can be shared with your doctor so we can see how your glucose control is, even better than these isolated random blood sticks that are done. This is where technology is going. Wearable health technology, such as a smartwatch. Many people are wearing smartwatches these days. We're all counting steps, tracking heart rates, and other fitness measures. Now, generally, your step count and these other fitness parameters are not that useful to your healthcare provider, but they are a very important tool to help you, to motivate you to keep stepping, to keep fit, to keep your heart rate up. And it can show you deficiencies where you thought you were doing well. So you just went for a walk, you're sweating, you thought it was a great walk and you burnt a lot of calories, but you look at the graph from the watch and your heart rate barely went anywhere. It just was a hot day, that's why you were sweating. Or maybe because you were wearing all these layers of clothes thinking it was a great workout. But these devices help to motivate and push you to do better and improve cardiovascular fitness. The technology is improving and now they're able to monitor other features such as even your pulse oximetry, which is your blood oxygen level. So you can tell if your oxygen level is falling low. Now it's not supposed to unless you have a medical illness and it's not a means of monitoring disease, but it's, again, useful information to help assess what your fitness level is. Menstrual cycle tracking is also included in many of these um, wearable fitness devices. The face-to-face -face consultation, though, remains important and will never die. We need this means of uh, consultation to assess our new patients, our complicated patients particularly, and if the patient or the doctor prefers this. And this means also facilitates quick and therapeutic interventions. I remember recently being a patient being referred to me for a swelling in the abdomen. 
because it was a face-to-face -face consultation, I was able to palpate the abdomen and determine that the swelling was due to fluid. And immediately stick a needle in and drain that fluid and send it for analysis. That sort of rapid intervention would not be possible in a virtual visit. The face-to-face -face visit, though, looks differently these days. Both of us are wearing masks. The patient must wear a mask, the provider must wear a mask. And often the provider is wearing gloves as well, and there is even more adherence to strict hand hygiene. Pre-screening must be done, and of course we need to modify our opening hours, because gone are the days when doctor comes at four to a waiting room of 25 patients and leaves by six. Let's stagger the appointment times so we don't have crowded waiting rooms and, re and raise the risk of transmission of COVID-19 disease. The device here is a point of care machine. These have been on the rise and there are many coming out. Every year there's a new one. This device can measure with a small amount of blood, similar to what would be obtained from a finger stick for blood glucose monitoring. It can tell us a lot of information. Your blood count, are you anemic? Do you have kidney failure? Are your electrolytes, electrolytes abnormal? All of this information can be gathered in these simple, rapid devices, which can revolutionize care and cut down on the number of visits required. So, so I see you today, and I think you need this test done. I can do this right away and get the information, rather than see you now, send you to do the test, and bring you back again. Now, there are many factors to consider as we step into this world post-COVID-19 and embrace technology and what it offers. We must ensure that cost our customers, i.e. our patients, are satisfied. We want to improve patient outcome. We become physicians knowing the principle of beneficence. Am, am I doing the best for my patient? We must always strive to obtain this. And of course, from our Hippocratic Oath, we must always remember, first, do no harm. Are your COVID-related changes affecting patient care? Yes, it may affect patient care. Is it negatively affecting my patient? And if it is, how can I intervene to improve my patient's outcome? We still want to prevent COVID transmission, and we want to adhere to government protocol because we must act for the greater good of our nation. And so we must balance these multiple factors so we can ensure better outcomes. But of course, one must almost always consider any medical legal catastrophe that can occur because of actions that we take, which we say are due to COVID-related measures. Are we closing practice and leaving our patients without a doctor, without care, because we're afraid of transmission of COVID-19? Did we provide them with alternative solutions, another provider, for example, so that they're not left out in the wilderness? These are things we must, con must consider from an ethical and a medical legal standpoint. And of course, we must remember, our patients are anxious. And so we must do what we can to quell their fears and also to reduce any sense they may have of discrimination. I've seen it myself multiple times. Patient is in the waiting room, throat itches and they cough, and the entire waiting room erupts. This sort of a behavior, we must work to try and quell their fears and help to improve acceptance of our patients. They must feel like we are accessible, they must know we're accessible and that we're working towards their greater good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nicholson Spence. You know, the shift in the way we administer healthcare was always coming with the advances in science and technology. But COVID-19 has just accelerated that process. Science facilitating self-monitoring, science facilitating remote diagnosis, science facilitating prescription filling, science and its application launching us into the future and redefining healthcare. Now from healthcare to education, the disruption from COVID-19 touches all sectors. But from healthcare to education, science is in action fighting COVID-19. And to explore how science and technology is redefining education is a lady I have worked very closely with on a variety of projects. In fact, I am privileged to call her friend. 
So I know her well enough for you to believe me when I say she is an entire ideas lab for education and philanthropy. I speak of Dr. Rebecca Tortello. For the last five years, Dr. Tortello has served as the education specialist at UNICEF Jamaica. For the past 15 years, Dr. Tortello has regularly lectured at the University of the West Indies in the Department of Education and is the author of a number of articles on education. Dr. Tortello has also worked with the Jamaican government as senior advisor consultant to the Minister of Education. She has directed the Spanish Jamaican Foundation and served on numerous boards, including the Early Childhood Commission and the Jamaica Commission for UNESCO, the Jamaica Library Service, and the Institute of Jamaica. She holds a PhD in education from Columbia University, a master's in education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and a bachelor's degree in history and literature from Harvard College. Dr. Tortello has written a popular Jamaican history book, Pieces of the Past, a number of children's picture books, and has edited a number of early childhood teacher workshop series used in schools all across Jamaica. I give you Dr. Rebecca Tortello, who will speak on science and technology in the post-COVID world, redefining education. Thank you, Dr. Singh Wilmot, for your kind introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to present here today and share some thoughts on ways in which we are reimagining education and using science in action to fight COVID-19. I'm very happy to share some of the work that UNICEF Jamaica and the many different country offices in over 170 countries around the world have been undertaking to support governments, students, schools, teachers, parents, to find ways to address and meet the many challenges that this crisis has revealed. In many ways, COVID-19 has catapulted education systems forward by leaps and bounds that we were not prepared for. Most systems were unprepared and really people are, and schools and teachers and parents have been showing great resilience and trying to bounce back as best as they can. There's little doubt that we are in what some consider to be the greatest education emergency of our lifetime. Many, many children's education is under threat. 1.6 billion children around the world, for example. Most of those, more than 40, more than 80% of those are in developing countries. 63 million teachers and the global education workforce are trying to figure out ways to maintain that, the learning and make sure that the learning does not stop. The impact on the global economy to date has been estimated at 10 trillion. We do not have these figures for Jamaica or for the Caribbean yet, but these are global figures and I think they're worth sharing. At the bottom of this slide, you'll also see some numbers that um, give us an idea of the gender challenges that some countries will face in relation to school-aged, secondary school-aged young women who may, not, may or may not return to school. As we know in this region, our challenge is more often young men, but we just don't have that data. When you look at the Caribbean, you'll notice that close to 1.4 million students have been affected. In Jamaica, some 600,000 children were able, the ministry has told us, to continue accessing some form of schooling. The schooling did not stop, even though the school's doors were closed. But were they able to access that content regularly, every day, for uninterrupted, long, sustained periods? That's questionable. We do know that the ministry and its partners, of which UNICEF is one, made every effort to make sure that some form of content could be delivered, whether it was online, via TV, via radio, via printed packets, etc. And we know that some 30,000 teachers have also been rallying and doing the best they can to be able to reach their students. Pre-COVID, we knew a lot. We knew a fair amount about what was happening in our schools. And we could look and see that girls consistently outperform our boys, Data indicates a three-year grade difference between the wealthiest and the poorest quintiles in the region. Those learning gaps that appear in early childhood and primary, they're maintained often through high school, and parental involvement and support varies widely. So really, we know that learners, teachers, education providers have many challenges. In our region, those are compounded, particularly in Jamaica and parts of the island, by violence that might interrupt schooling, by financial barriers that might interrupt schooling, 
And by, again, I'm going to raise the issue of lack of sustained parental involvement. So globally, we know there's a critical need for better access to quality education and improved learning pathways. The pandemic has brought about rapid change, changes in policy, changing in the learning tools. Many of us didn't know what Zoom was before. We're very familiar with Zoom now. Changes in school leadership, collaboration between teachers and parents. Parents have a newfound appreciation for teachers. I am sure I do as a parent. I have two young children, two teenage children. One has adjusted much better than the other to online learning, but online learning can never fully take the place of face-to-face -face engagement. We're aware of that. Innovative pathways have emerged. Often those pathways involve technology. So we've seen teachers being very creative using videos, using songs, using games, using WhatsApp. The Early Childhood Commission in Jamaica has told us that 80% of their contact with parents has been through ongoing WhatsApp groups with um, the children and the parents on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, zero-rated education portals. Here are some images of what we're calling the new normal grouped around, looking at a TV screen, printed packets being distributed. This was in West Milan by Principal Karen King, who took the ministry's printed packets and hired bikers to go out and deliver them to, the, to his students. Then we have self-paced, asynchronous learning taking place, looking at the computer screen in the bottom right. And the bottom left, we have an innovative early childhood practitioner who's showing us significant creativity and resilience in a blackboard that she painted on the perimeter of her school and every morning would go and put up lessons for the children in her community. The children would come, take photos with their parents, go home, work them out, and then meet her socially distanced in her backyard as she lives in the community and go through the work on a day-to-day -day basis. UNICEF Jamaica has been using technology as well, and we've been telling the stories of these innovative educators on our, all of our social media platforms and sharing them with mainstream media. We used um, social influencers to create a number of infographics and commercials and social media messaging that shared risk communication, how can you get this illness, how can you prevent it, what can you do, how to allay your children's fears, how to protect children online, knowing how many more children have been catapulted online, how to work with children with disabilities at home, um, knowing the great disruption that, took, that has occurred in their lifestyles and their routines. And we also um, worked specifically with that community to create a series of infographics and infomercials sharing tips for, for parents of children with disabilities. We've gone, we've used, as I said, basic um, media and basic technology and then also more complicated technology. So some of the basic media examples would be phone lines. We've created helplines with the National Parenting Support Commission in partnership with the NGO Fight for Peace and the Victoria Mutual Foundation and the Women's Center of Jamaica to target parents, give them a, a lifeline, a helpline to call for support as they seek to become their children's teachers. They've always been their children's first teachers, but this crisis has called on them to really step up to that table more than they perhaps were prepared for. These helplines also provide some forms of psychosocial support. We also rolled out, or we've been using our U-Report platform, but we ramped it up, I guess you could say. U-Report is a data messaging system that works on cell phones and online uh, on Facebook for a while it was working as well. Anybody who's 13 and over, I think it's 13 to 29, can become a U reporter, and it gives us a few different ways that we can reach young people. We can poll them in real time and get their opinions on different issues that are taking place. We can find out how much they know about a particular issue, so we worked closely with the Ministry of Health to do that in relation to COVID-19. We can also use U report to issue chat bots and send information to people, so if you answer no to a question on how do you how can you contract COVID-19? You'll be sent to information that, that tells you how it works and how to prevent it. So encouraging those of you who have young children, teenagers, to ask them if they're interested in joining. They can Google you Report Jamaica or join using the number on the screen. We also used you Report very early on in the response after schools closed in mid-March to poll 10, our 10,000 you reporters and ask them, what they were concerned about in relation to COVID-19, what were their general thoughts, and we worked with the Prime Minister's office and helped him to facilitate a town hall for young people. Um, we also then went on to poll students. You do a distance learning poll and ask them what were they thinking, how was their distance learning experience. So 
those answers were interesting, and you have to keep in mind, your report is really an opinion paste poll, so it's not a scientific poll, uh, but it gives us a snapshot of what people are thinking, and of the 1,000 that responded, 400 responded, 450 responded to the majority of questions, and we learned from them that 90% of them were able to access online learning. 47% actually online learning using Zoom, et cetera, and other such platforms. 26% using WhatsApp, and 17% using video conferencing. About 56% of them, at least half, said they had daily access, and some 80% of them said they had regular contact with their teachers. Regular doesn't mean daily, but it means some regular contact. 85% of them told us that they had support from parents. But, and this is important, as our school system prepares to go back to school, 45% reported feeling frustrated with the distance learning options that were provided. As our systems in the region begin to plan or are planning to reopen school in the next few months, they are grappling with the realization that this pandemic has brought about rapid changes in the terms of the skills that are being demanded. So we're in the fourth industrial revolution, as tech people will say. We know climate change is a major issue and a threat. And we have new skills that are going to be required as a result of COVID-19, especially digital and socio-emotional or lifelong skills, for example. One of the issues that all systems are facing is that the challenge is not only how to reopen schools in terms of public health and safety protocols and the financial challenges and the spatial challenges that that will create, but also when schools reopen, how do we reduce the inequity that has taken place by the compounding of what's called the summer slide, which is a well-known phenomenon that affects all children have a learning loss in the summer, whatever income level the children come from but children from lower income homes have slide further. The loss is more significant and harder to combat. We are now seeing the potential for a compounded summer slide and COVID slide as we head back into September. And that is why our ministry has said that they will be using the first few weeks in September to both sensitize to the new public health and safety protocols and UNICEF and our partners, WHO, UNFPA, the World Bank, have been sharing that guidance with ministries around the region. And you can see that guidance reflected in the material that has been disseminated to schools but also how to do assessments, what kinds of assessments for all age groups from early childhood on up so that our teachers can be able to identify as best as possible where their students are and how to try and minimize or close the gaps. The ministry has been using technology increasingly to contact parents. So that's another example of science in action. Before this, the ministry, our ministry I'm talking about in Jamaica was using social media, but they have definitely ramped that up. They have been running regional Zoom calls that cap out at a thousand parents. And I know I tried to go to the Zoom call for my region and I couldn't get in because it was full. It was full. And in those Zoom calls, they are sharing with parents all the information that they have been sending out to schools. They're trying to reassure parents what will take place come September. And they have told us that about half of our 900 primary and secondary schools have enough space that they can meet the public health and safety requirements and operate normally, of course, with children wearing masks, children over the age of two. They have given schools some amount of autonomy to decide with their school boards and their school communities, how will they, how will they teach? How will the students learn? Will it be a combination of face-to-face -face and computer-aided learning? Will there be shifts? Some children come on a Monday, Tuesday, some come on a Thursday, Friday, and then they continue at home. Will there be an extended day so that there's no congregation of children in between the changing over of the shifts? Do parents wish to homeschool? If they do, there are protocols in place that they would need to follow. Or will it be completely online learning? For example, sixth formers, who are obviously our oldest secondary students, are being encouraged to consider doing their learning all online because they're able to self-regulate, to concentrate, and to perform based on this type of, through the system, and that will free up extra space on the school compound for the younger students. Early childhood is also grappling with this. Many of our early childhood schools do not have huge amounts of space, and so they have been working on their protocols, which they are disseminating as well. And in the midst of all this, the ministry has been working on ongoing teacher training for teachers from early childhood on up. So it's been a very busy summer for many of our teachers and, of course, many of our parents who have our children at home um, engaged in perhaps too much technology, and we're all struggling to find ways to combat that and move our children off of the screen in the summer um, to help them make sure to maintain their health and wellness. So the ministry also told us that PATH programs will continue. 
that's an important point because PATH is also using science and technology to disseminate the, cash, the conditional cash transfers to family, so that has also accelerated. That wasn't in existence before in the way it is now, but it tells us that the school was a central location and is a central community space that goes far beyond teaching and learning. The type of psychosocial support that students get at school, the type of the, 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 the meals that they receive at school, all of those are critical. And so when school reopens, that will allay some challenges that many families face. But the ministry is also assuring us that they are trying to find ways to close the digital divide by procuring and distributing over 100,000 tablets targeting the children on PATH and children with disabilities. So when we do reopen schools, we have to work out ways to reopen schools stronger. How are we doing that? We're trying to find out what other school systems in our region and around the world have done because they have opened up. Their school, their school systems work on a different calendar, for example, in South America. And of course, in China and other countries where the pandemic started earlier, they are back, back to school. So what have they been doing? They've been finding ways to accelerate the implementation of digital strategies and promote scientific literacy for students and for teachers. And that point is critical. They're trying to find ways to bolster their education management information system so that they can use data-driven decisions in, um, in the teaching and learning process. Expanding connectivity, that is no longer a luxury, that is critical. Training teachers and students to use distance learning modalities, using um, assessments, uh, both technological and otherwise, to, to accelerate early detection so that we can increase early support, and find ways to work out a, a decent and sustainable adaptive learning platform for curriculum implementation. Other things that school systems have to work out, and they will also require the use of science and technology, is how to update their school infrastructure to make it more climate resilient. The use of solar energy, for example, to make them more environmentally sustainable. The last thing any of our countries in this region needs is a hurricane or some sort of natural disaster on top of this pandemic that could wipe out the buildings and the equipment that we currently have. They are, and that brings to the point, me to the point about the importance of having feasible and workable emergency plans for our schools. We have to expand training programs. We have to focus on teaching lifelong learning skills that in involve coping strategies. We have to reinforce and strengthen literacy and numeracy. And there are many apps and technological innovations that do that now that can be accessed data free. We have to equip our students with skills to adapt to what is an ever changing labor market and focus on capitalizing on research and development opportunities. And part of this, we can't do any of this without establishing strong partnerships. So just to give you an example of some of the partnerships that UNICEF Jamaica has um, embarked upon in COVID, prior to COVID and now ramped up during COVID, is one with the National College for Education Leadership that trains our school leaders. So prior to COVID, we launched in January a child-friendly schools online asynchronous course, which takes school leaders through the Convention on the Rights of the Child and how can you translate those rights and responsibilities into a school setting and what makes a child-centered, accessible, child-friendly school. Um, hundreds of educators have signed on and taken that course already. We are nearing 1,000 at this point. And we launched on June 1st a virtual instructional leadership course which looked at best practices from around the world in how to create a virtual instructional leadership plan for schools. And we are now in our second or third cohort of that. And our aim is to train at least 2,000 school leaders. So when our teachers and our school leaders go through these courses, they come out with uh, the virtual instructional leadership course with a plan which tells them which platform do they want to use, how will they communicate with their parents, how will they communicate with their students, how can they assess the learning, et cetera, et cetera. Other partnerships, we've actually done specific tangible donations of tablets to the ministry's special education unit, tablets with data access thanks to a partnership with Digicel, tablets with hardcover cases because they'll be going to our children with special needs, and also telephones through a partnership with the Ministry of Health to mental health service providers in our child guidance clinics to be able to answer calls from families who have been referred from the school to the child guidance clinic for psychosocial support. And this is part of our um, partnership with the Ministry's guidance counseling unit to accelerate and uh, streamline and scale up a framework called the School-Wide Positive Behavior Intervention and Support Framework, or SWPBIS. The last partnership I'm going to really mention is one called the Learning Passport, which is a, partner, a global partnership between UNICEF and Microsoft. 
And it's an example of thinking big. In every crisis, there's an opportunity. So now is a time that we all need to be thinking big. And UNICEF and Microsoft are doing that. Learning Passport is an example of that. What is Learning Passport? Learning Passport is a technology platform that enables high quality, flexible learning with alignment between curriculum framework, content, pedagogy, and assessment. And that part is critical as well, and assessment, because it provides individual student records. It's a supplementary tool. That's also important. It's not a primary tool. It's a supplementary tool that supports both formal and non-formal education. So it can be available online and offline. It gives, it's a teacher-learner interface. It provides local content. It provides psychosocial support, special ed support, and peer support. And it's designed to try and close the learning poverty gap and improve learning outcomes from early childhood through primary through secondary. It comes free to a country and um, with Microsoft support in-country. Where is Learning Passport? Currently, it's being used by Timor-Leste, and it's being worked out for Bangladesh, Jordan, Kenya, Kosovo, the Ukraine, and it's in discussion here in Guyana, in Costa Rica, in Lesotho, in Montenegro, Rwanda, Somalia, Suriname, and Vietnam. So it's a platform that a curriculum unit can take and augment their existing curriculum with online content that has been vetted and approved um, for different ages, and then it has the capacity to be recorded offline and be made available to students who don't have continuous online support. So this is what's on offer for Jamaica. The ministry is considering it now. Their curriculum unit is reviewing it, and it would, if it, if it comes to pass, it would be called jamaica.learningpassport.unicef.org, and it would be a license in perpetuity and give the ministry teachers of all stages of the system access to a growing supplemental content library that includes content such as Khan Academy and other well-known uh, tried and tested online uh, platforms. So for education, many questions remain and science in action is going to help us to answer some of them. Here are some of the main ones that we've been thinking of and grappling with. How do we minimize inequities in the system? That's always critical. How do we support our most marginalized students? How do we make sure that all of our children have equal opportunities? How do we regain learning losses? Who is going to deliver our education? How are we delivering it? Are we delivering it face-to-face, -face, blended, at school, at home, both? How can we engage new partners, parents, communities, the private sector, in our case also in the diaspora? Is there a role for regional partnerships? But two things are certain while we're contemplating all these questions. The well-being of our children and teachers is paramount, and science and technology is critical. I'd like to begin to close with a quote from the UN Secretary General where he has put out this charge recently saying, we must take bold steps now to create inclusive, resilient, quality education systems that are fit for the future. So to learn more and to see how we're chronicling COVID-19 in Jamaica and all of our country offices are doing the same, please visit our website and follow us online. And this last slide is an image from a global campaign which also links back to technology again. Now a lot of fundraising is being done online and this is a uniquely Jamaican partnership with Bob Marley's the Bob Marley Foundation, Tough Gong International, UNICEF, and the jewelry maker Pandora, where Pandora has launched, they've reimagined, Bob Marley's children have, and other friends and um, partners have re-sung Bob Marley's iconic song, One Love, and the message that comes across in that song of love and unity and tolerance is perhaps needed now more than ever. This One Love Reimagine campaign is a way to drive donors to make donations, download the song, make donations, and Pandora is matching those donations up to a million dollars, and then that funding goes to UNICEF country offices around the world to help us as we all strive to reimagine education, to reimagine health systems, and to make worlds a world that is fit for our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tortello, for sharing the technology and innovation that UNICEF is pioneering all over the world. Like healthcare, this revolution in education was always coming, wasn't it? But COVID-19 has acted like a catalyst once more, speeding up the process and propelling us into the future. It is a challenging time, but it is also an exciting time, ladies and gentlemen, as we all put science in action and respond to the effects of COVID-19 on education. Now, as usual, we save the best for last, our youth, 
our students, our young scientists, they are represented here today. They represent the best of us. And in this segment, we present the student response to COVID-19. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to a brilliant early career chemist, an outstanding student leader, Mr. Marcel Denny. Mr. Denny is a past student of the Meadowbrook High School, who holds a BSc with first class honors from the UWE, majoring in food chemistry with a double minor in general chemistry and management studies. He is currently pursuing a PhD in organic chemistry with a focus on the synthesis of aromatic heterocycles and the potential biological activities they offer. Mr. Denny has received outstanding leadership awards on more than one occasion for contributions to co-curricular activities, and he now serves as the faculty representative for postgraduate students. Please help me, ladies and gentlemen, to give a warm welcome to an outstanding young man, Mr. Marcel Denny, who will give this afternoon's student response to COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcel Denny. I'm the postgraduate rep for the Faculty of Science and Technology, and today I'll be bringing to you the graduate student's response to COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 has disrupted our lives in many ways, and it has halted all forms of major activities, and it has given us some time to reevaluate certain questions, questions about our safety, our health, education, and our business, and how do we face these new challenges in this new post-COVID world. The Faculty of Science and Technology prides itself in teaching, educating, and developing critical thinking skills to the students to help them to use science and technology to answer some of these questions, to bring innovative solutions to some of these problems that face our way. But before we go any further into some of these solutions, let me just give you a little bit of a preview of what the faculty has to offer. Now, Within the faculty, we have 30 graduate programs and 350 graduate students. Now, they're divided among six departments, which include chemistry, computing, geography and geology, life sciences, mathematics, physics. We also have five science centers, institutes, and units, which include Biotechnology Center, Center for Marine Sciences, Natural Products Institute, Earthquake Unit, Mona Institute for Applied Sciences. Now, the Faculty of Science and Technology graduate students are working on a variety of problems, but here are just a few examples that are related to COVID-19 and how they will tackle some of these issues in the post-COVID-19 world. Now, in late February, early March, as word about COVID-19 spread across various news outlets, it became increasingly more challenging to access things like hand sanitizers. Recognizing this, on the 12th of March, the UWE Mona Chemical Society held a hand sanitizers workshop. Now, in this workshop, we taught undergraduate students how to make their own hand sanitizers, which are alcohol-based. After we gave them the general information of the formulation, we taught them how they could modify their hand sanitizers to suit them best without compromising the integrity of what is necessary for it to work. You can see in the top left-hand corner a picture of a student who's adding different sensory agents to the hand sanitizer to give it a, a specific aroma that she personally desires. And we also, also allow them to change the consistency. Some want desired it to be a spray versus others to be more of a gel-like consistency. And they were allowed to do this. We also drove home to them the, how, the chemistry of how these hand sanitizers work as we believe that it was important that they understand the chemistry that was taking place. Now, this effort was championed by Mr. Ricardo Price, which is seen in the top left-hand corner, who is the current president of UE Mona Chemical Society. And he, as well as some other graduate students, helped the students to create samples, which is seen on the bottom right-hand corner, and a picture was taken of some of the students who were present in the top right-hand corner. Now, news about this took social media by storm as various people were ending up calling into the department asking if they could visit the workshop. We even had people visiting the workshop to learn about how they could make their own hand sanitizers and if they could get some of the samples that was given to the students at that day. 
Now, moving forward, we're in the lockdown. And one of the questions that became evident to us is, can we predict the amount of persons that are out there that have yet to be tested for the COVID-19 virus? For every person that has contracted the virus and tested positive, there's still a number of persons who are untested and who have been exposed and we don't know yet if they have the virus or not. Recognizing this issue, Daniel Raphael, a student within mathematics, along with his, with his co-worker Chantel Reynolds, a statistical analyst from a financing institution, major financing institution, extracted global data from the time of January to April and used this to account for different variations such as age, population density, among other criteria. Using this information, they developed a model to try and fit it onto Jamaica's current situation. Now, this model serves to help to predict the amount of persons who are potentially existing out there that have not been tested. I must point out, however, that this is preliminary work and further work is needed as it is responsive based on the amount of tests that's been provided. It is known that during any form of economic downturn that there tends to be an increase in crime and violence. Recognizing this fact, Students from the Department of Geography and Geology came up with a remedy for this solution. Using a multiple dimensional approach, they implemented an idea of using Comstat, which is a computer software used internationally for predictive policing. How Comstat works is that it gathers data on crime statistics and presents it in a logical way to use predictive policing and recognize its trend. Due to, rec due to the known strain on the police constabulary force, this software could facilitate the better use or utilization of their available resources and cutting down on costs. Now, this program will be used and to help with predictive policing, and they will train the constabulary force on how to use this program, and it will assist them greatly into lowering and prevention of crime. They also use the idea of social and community interventions. Now, we recognize that there are many psychological issues that was faced by a person during this pandemic. How do we move on from here? Now, they will be providing counseling to these persons who are in need. Also, they will be taking all of other forms of community interventions through volunteerism, among other things. Now, they enter this idea, this proposal, in the democratizing innovation in the Americas, DIA Labs Adiathon competition where they won first place. And due to this, they received funding to, to, to push this project forward. Now we see from this how they're using science and technology, particularly technology, to help answer some of these COVID-related problems and issues that have arrived since COVID-19. COVID-19 has pushed us to bring in our education system to a more online fashion. And early childhood education is particularly important because it's at this time we set their academic strives to help them to move forward to their desired destination. Online education has become more and more important in this pandemic as we no longer can face our students in a face-to-face -face fashion. Now recognizing this need, Stefan Watson came up with an idea of using a software to help teach Jamaican children how to read. Now, we must point out that speech recognition software already exists out there, but there is none that is uniquely for Jamaicans, meaning that based on the studies done, it was discovered that Jamaican English is unique versus other variation of English that is used. For example, when you say the word chocolate, it's pronounced locally as chocolate. Wingworm is wing worm with more emphasis on wing versus ring. Recognizing this fact, they utilize their different speech patterns and programming it into the software to pick up on this differentiation and recognize it into text. How speech recognition software works is that it breaks down the word patterns and the sounds into individual pieces, then matches it to a, using an algorithm, matches it to a corresponding word and transcribe that into text. So if a child were to read something and say computer, they will see the word computer pop up before their eyes and this will better facilitate them in their reading process. COVID-19 has also brought about greater use for local resources. 
Now, Mr. Rayleigh Dunkley is working on modification of cassava starch to make various products. When we say modification, we basically mean adding a tag. We add in different functional groups. Think of them as tags. Now, these tags will better facilitate certain functionality of the starch. For example, if you want the starch to be thicker, you can add tag A. If you want to be more elastic, you can add tag B, and so on and so on. Now, using some modification of the starch shells, starch components, he made potentially new absorbance. And these new absorbance are biodegradable and they're easy and, and they can be reused multiple times. When we say absorbent, we mean like a sponge. They could be used for medicinal purposes for like gauzes to treat wounds. And it can be reused multiple times by sanitary, sanitizing it and, in, and reusing it as necessary. They have, he has also produced different type of soft gels that serve several potential applications within the pharmaceutical and food industries. For example, it is well known that it is easier to consume a soft gel versus a hard tablet, especially for children. Another example of soft gels would be like a cardiovascular oil tablets, cardiovascular oil gels, I should say, and their usefulness. Also, based on the modification of the starch molecule, we could have release of the active ingredients at different rates. Now, here is an example of the modification starch gel as an absorbent. Now, we see that an example of it being wet and is now squeezing the moisture out of it. You see, it goes back into its dry like state. And then, upon reapplying to water, you'll be able to see going back to its original shape and consistency. So this is just demonstrating how it could be the same gel, could be used multiple times for the same purpose, to achieve the same goals. In the next video, we are showing you how we can have different release of the active ingredients at different times. As these starch soft gels have been modified at different extents, and we see they're dissolving at different rates. Now what you could do is put active ingredients into these soft gels, allow it to set, and based on how fast it dissolves, you can have release of your active ingredients occurring at a different rate. For example, you see in the first one, the one in the forest right, it's dissolving at a slower pace. So it would have a longer time before the active ingredient is released in the system. I know you guys must be aware of this popular song, breadfruit. You want breadfruit. But think about using breadfruit in our local manufacturing industry for a greater extent. Now, I must point out that it has been researched and a lot of interest has been garnered about using local products for flour over the years. But Chevenise Morgan is particularly interested in using the breadfruit flour and the different varieties. Now, if you look on the graph, we see that comparing wheat flour to Jamaican yellow breadfruit flour, it has similar nutritional properties to that of whole wheat flour. And it's particularly important to say that it's gluten-free, noticing that recognizing the fact that people have gluten allergies and could be used as a good substitute. Internationally, it is also being researched to use as an as a alternative for various baking products, as you see that they're using it to bake bread, which is gluten-free bread. So continuous research is done on this to produce breadfruit, flour, and could be used as a substitute to aid local agro-processing. Recognizing that some persons may be resistant to the change, we could use composite flour with a 15 to 20% ratio of breadfruit flour to a whole wheat flour in various baking applications. Based on consumer compliance, we could continue using these composite flours or we could use breadfruit flour as an alternative completely. This is a potential way we could move forward using our own local resources and help benefit our economy at a better rate. Must point out an honorary mention. You'd have recognized the work done by Yekeni Bryan in pre-labs. I would like to point out Mr. Shane Smith from the Department of Physics, assisted with development of the ventilator systems. Also, he assisted in production of over 300 nose swabs, 2,800 face shields, and 30 hand washing stations, which were distributed to different healthcare facilities. Just in summary, we see that how the Graduate students of the Faculty of Science and Technology are answering some of these post-COVID-19 questions. Can we make our own hand sanitizer? We saw early response by Mr. Ricardo Price 
president of the Mona Chemical Society, we see Daniel Raphael and Chantal Reynolds, a statistical analyst who is currently working on developing a mathematical model to predict the amount of persons who have COVID-19 that have yet to be tested. Shane Smith from the Department of Physics that are developing protective gear with, by working with prelapse. We also see Ms. Chevanese Morgan, breadfruit flour as an alternative to whole wheat flour. Mr. Riley Duncan, modification of starch to make soft gels and different absorbents. Stefan Watson, speech recognition software to help in early childhood education. Our friends from geography and geology, Christina Dorothy, Ali Mahabir, and Romari Anderson in their crime prevention, social and community intervention policy that they're putting forward to help to fight against COVID-19 related issues. So we see in the various ways that the Faculty of Science and Tech postgraduate students are innovative. They are thinking about how we can use science and technology to make our lives, your lives, the lives of the countries better. How can we better facilitate development of this country in various ways? I invite you to go to the faculty website and look on some of the things that the faculty is doing. You'll be surprised to know. My name is Marcel Denny. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, our students have done us proud, and the UE shines through them. They have put science in action to fight COVID-19. Thanks to all our students and to you, Marcel, for leading this response. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end. That is it for our series Fighting COVID-19, Science in Action. Remember, you can pass on the word to others who could not see the talks in the forum today. All three fora are still available for you to view, so please continue to share the links. I want to thank all of today's speakers, Dr. Vicki Gardner, who joined us all the way from Australia to bring news of Commonwealth chemistry and the need for international scientific cooperation in the fight against COVID-19. Dr. David Picking, who has reinforced the potential of Jamaican natural products in healthcare and in the fight against COVID-19. Dr. Louis Ray Harris, breaking down the conspiracy theories surrounding 5G and COVID-19. Dr. Peter John Gordon for using science to follow the economic fallout brought by COVID-19. Dr. Samantha Nicholson Spence, who has shown us that science and technology is redefining healthcare and positioning us to fight COVID-19. Dr. Rebecca Tortello, preparing us for some of the innovations in education that science and technology has made possible as we build resilience to COVID-19. And Mr. Marcel Denny, ladies and gentlemen, who reminds us that our future is safe in the hands of young scientists who are putting science in action to fight COVID-19. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for your contribution to this forum today. We thank the entire UETV production team, led by Mr. Jamani Dunn, and supported by Mr. Odane Thompson and Mr. Kadeem Lawrence. The talent and professionalism of these young men is world class, ladies and gentlemen. Our team from FST has truly enjoyed working with you gentlemen to make this possible. Thanks to the entire external engagement committee in the Faculty of Science and Technology for organizing this event. You know yourselves, I won't call all the names. For all those early Friday morning planning sessions, we say thank you. For your ideas and your hard work in getting this to the public, a special thank you to the chairman of this committee, Dr. Andre Coy, for his leadership and our super resourceful administrative secretary, Mrs. Terry Ann Collins Frey. It does not matter the time of day you call on Terry. She is always there and it does not matter what you want done. Terry will get it done. Thank you, Terry. Thanks also to Mr. Maxwell Williams, who has been invaluable to our team. 
Thanks to the Dean of our faculty, Professor Michael Taylor. His vision inspired this series of fora, and he inspired us all to do it. To all other colleagues and students of the FST, we say thanks for your support. Thanks to the moderator of the online chat, Dr. Kimberly Stevenson, for coordinating a robust interaction between audience and speakers. This is the life of a forum like this, and we have had stimulating interactions. And finally, I thank all of you out there, all of you from Jamaica, the rest of the Caribbean, and the world. We thank you for sharing the link and for tuning in. Remember, continue to like and to share so that this series can benefit many others. Remember also that we are the FST, your go-to place for science knowledge, research, and solutions. We are right here at the University of the West Indies Mona Campus. And I am Marvadine Singh Wilmot asking you to keep safe by putting science in action and using it to fight COVID-19. Good evening, everybody.